one. I'll start by uh, turning on my video. All righty. Um, so, welcome to the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, this meeting is being held via teleconference. Um, and we are going to start. Sorry, I'm just getting organized here. Um, let's see, what's some information? So some information to cover under the welcome. Uh, members of the public may participate by following the instructions listed on the agenda. Um, you can also view and listen to the meeting on live stream, cable, TV, Granicus, and YouTube. Um, if you wanna provide public comment, there are two methods you can uh, do so through. Um, all members of the public will remain on mute until the individual identifies uh, that they would like to speak and you're unmuted. The instructions on how to uh, participate and how to provide comment are in the agenda here. Um, and so with that, I will do a roll call. Uh, starting with uh, Commissioner Oliverio. Here. All right, Commissioner Allen. Present. Commissioner Bonilla. Here. Commissioner Caballero. Here. And Commissioner Yesney. Here. All right, we all are all here. So moving on to the uh, next agenda item, that is recognition of Melanie Griswold's service to the city of San Jose and the Planning Commission. Um, does staff have something on this? Hello, Chair. This is uh, Rosalind Huey. I believe Jennifer may have prepared a certificate uh, to be read. And since I don't see Jennifer on, uh, perhaps, Chair, if you would like to extend uh, the opportunity uh, for yourself and all of the commissioners to provide comments and just thank uh, Commissioner Griswold. Um, I would certainly like to do that on behalf um, of the city administration and certainly our department. Um, we're sad to see her go, but very thankful uh, for the commissioner's service, uh, the insights and perspectives that she brought to the commission. And again, just thanking her for lending her time and expertise to work with us and serve the residents of the city. So thank you so very much. Would any of my fellow commissioners like to add anything? Feel free to just chime in. This is uh, Rolando. Uh, Melanie, in, in the brief time we got to work together, I was impressed by your uh, your professionalism, your dedication to, to the craft, and, and I do recall uh, as I was uh, working to, to get myself appointed to the uh, Planning Commission, your, your kind words and, and your words of advice, so I, I wish you the very best, and uh, I'm sure I'll run into you along the way. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. All best wishes in your uh, next endeavor and all the best to you and your family. Thank you for your service. I think what I would hope is that Melanie takes her compassion for the citizens of San Jose and her passion for doing a good job with her into her new employment. Um, we'll all benefit from her then on an ongoing basis. I just want to say that I'm going to miss her uh, dedication and her uh, attention to detail. Uh, nobody reads through those resolutions and finds those uh, areas and errors like she does, and, and we'll definitely be missing that, that eye um, towards uh, all things uh, lawyerly on our 
commission, although I know Lulon is also a lawyer. <laughs> but um, but also on a personal note, I just really enjoyed getting to know you, Melanie, and I'm um, sad to see you go, but know that we'll be uh, working together in other ways in the future. So looking forward to that. This is uh, Commissioner Allen. Just want to uh, thank you, Commissioner Griswold, as uh, many have already said, for your thoughtful comments and your uh, consistent approach um, to uh, our work. Um, it's very refreshing to see someone who takes this um, stuff seriously and uh, approaches it with um, the respect it deserves. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I wish you all the best and uh, all the best to your family. And I hope you're doing well at this incredibly strange and difficult time. And I'll just echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Um, it was nice to work with Commissioner Griswold for a short time. I'm sure we will be um, working with her in a different capacity. Um, and uh, as uh, um, Marielle mentioned, uh, Commissioner Cabello mentioned, um, I don't usually uh, lament having another uh, attorney perspective uh, in our midst, but it was definitely cool to have someone paying attention to those details um, in addition to the big picture. Um, so I think that's it. Is staff any anything further on this item that I should know? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Jennifer emailed you the script to be read. Okay. Uh, let me see if I have that. Thank you. Do you know what time that was emailed? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. So I have so many emails uh, in, in my planning commission um, inbox. It's hard to <laughs> it's hard to find what it is that was emailed to me on this. I see Melanie is with us. Well, can we unmute Melanie and see if she would like to say anything? Can I unmute it? Yes. So um, I did want to say, you know, what a privilege and honor it was to serve on the Planning Commission. Um, having the chance to see what people, what the citizens of San Jose um, have to offer on the commission, what they have to offer when they come to do public comment, how many people really care about our community, and then of course, the planning staff and you know not just their dedication but the level of skill and their experience and um, and just the caring nature that they have about really shepherding our community was was really a gratifying experience for me and um, and it really made me it gave me so much confidence in our community so Thank you for allowing me to serve and, um, and for being such great fellow commissioners and I've learned a lot uh, from everybody. So thank you. Why does face disappear? Oh, what, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> My son wants to know why his face disappeared. <laughs> a very important question. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, I am I am not able to find the email that was uh, apparently sent to me. Um, so uh, I'm going to suggest either staff read it or. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I'm told it was sent to you at 1.50 p.m. Yeah, I, I went through my <laughs> inbox. I'm not seeing it. So um, maybe resend it right now, or we, or some other alternative. 
So Chair, if we're not able to resend it right now, our apologies. We will certainly make sure that Commissioner Griswold gets her certificate. Uh, we'll put it in the mail and want to be sure that you have that. And thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone. Are you a All right, we are going to move on then to the summary of hearings and procedures, and I will read this here. Uh, so the procedure for the hearing is as follows. After the staff report, applicants and appellants may make a five minute presentation. The meeting technician will connect persons who desire to speak to the commission to the meeting um, so they can be heard. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. Uh, after the public testimony, the applicant and appellant may make closing remarks marks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. Uh, the public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will take action on the item. Um, the planning commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. The Planning Commission's action on rezonings, prezonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is only advisory to the City Council. The City Council will hold public hearings on these items. Section 20.120.400 of the Municipal Code provides the procedures for legal protests to the City Council on rezonings and prezonings. The Planning Commission's action on conditional use permits is appealable to the City Council in accordance with Section 20.100.220 of the Municipal Code. Agendas and, well, yeah, we should probably take out that last line, which says that agendas and binders are near the door for your convenience. Um, I doubt that everyone has a binder near their door with the agenda. So um, we should uh, take that last line out of the script here. So then moving on to public comment. Um, this is the segment of the agenda where members of the public are invited to speak on items that are not already on the agenda. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly look here and see. Um, we do have two hands raised. Um, so again, if these hands are raised for um, to speak to something that is not already on the agenda, um, we'll go ahead and uh, unmute those folks. So staff, do you see those hands raised? John, you are unmuted, please begin to speak. John? John, can you hear me? All right, why don't we move on to the next person? I think he's there. Okay. John? I have a green screen saying I am viewing the PC webinar. Uh, and I have some clock ticking down. Can you hear me? Yes, please begin to speak. Okay, here we go. Good evening. I'm John Pastier, an architecture critic and an author of the first monograph on Cesar Pelli. I live in central San Jose. There's a lot that we could talk about and little time to do it. So I'll limit my remarks to urban design and architectural scale. This is a huge project encompassing 3.8 million square feet. In comparison, the Empire State Building has only 2.2 million square feet. Imagine City Hall, City View Plaza, 75% larger, it threatens to dwarf San Jose still emerging downtown. Proponents of the project refer to it as a campus. 
In other words, their vision is suburban and not urban. It's time to go back to the drawing board. There is plenty of room on the site for a preserved Caesar Pelly monument and a slightly scaled down new project. Its architects are very good ones and could do even better if asked to work in a more humanly scaled fashion. Save the Sphinx. All right, thank you, John. Um, I wanna reiterate that this time on the agenda is to speak to items that are not on the agenda. Um, so there's one other person whose hand is raised, someone named Mike. Um, if Mike, you want to speak to something that is not on the agenda, um, go ahead. Yes, thank you. So this is Mike Sodergren with the Preservation Action Council. I wanna uh, thank the commission for listening to our comments. Um, on April 20th, um, PAC sent a letter to the City of San Jose City Manager Planning Department, um, making the two basic statements that follow. Um, the Preservation Action Council of San Jose respectfully objects to the city's ongoing review, consideration, and approval of commercial development projects during a state of emergency. And while social distancing and shelter in place orders have been imposed on all city residents, continuing to review uh, and approve these projects poses an unnecessary and unfair burden on the people who do not view these projects as essential services. In an effort to push ahead with the review and approval of projects, if it's being done to keep staff employed or to uh, ensure that San Jose is shovel ready at the end of the pandemic, whenever that might be, we understand that to be a noble goal. However, we believe that the city should stop and think about this in the broader context. For example, there is considerable risk that assumptions about commercial project financing may be incorrect. There is considerable risk that prospective tenants of projects may pull back. The potential for project failures is clearly greater now. Projects that go forward have as a much greater likelihood of resulting in chain link fences around the perimeter of construction sites with big holes in the ground, where currently culturally significant buildings stand. There is a risk that San Jose's Envision 2040 plan is now based on assumptions that are no longer reasonable. We respectfully request that planning and the commission look at updating the Envision 2040 plan to include the impact of a global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I see a hand up, and that's Commissioner Oliverio. Um, Commissioner Oliverio, did you want to? Did you have a question or a comment? No, Chair. Just since the last two speakers didn't follow your direction, I would hope that uh, this would be their public comment for the agendized item. Great. Thanks. Uh, okay, and so we are going to go ahead and move on to agenda item number three, which is deferrals and removals from the calendar, and there is nothing there, so unless I hear otherwise from staff, we'll go ahead and move on to agenda item number four, which is the consent calendar. Um, we have one item on consent, and uh, so I'd ask if um, if there are any comments from the public or if anyone wants to remove this item from consent, otherwise um, I will entertain a motion. And I see that Commissioner Oliverio has his hand up. Go ahead, Commissioner Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation on, or just to approve the consent calendar, I think would be the motion. Second. Uh, Second. A second by Commissioner Yesney and Commissioner uh, <laughs> uh, Vera has her hand up. I was going to call you a commissioner, Vera. Actually, um, actually, um, I was going to comment on the deferrals. There is a request, so if you could take the vote on this first and then and then recall me. Okay. Um, uh, do, do any of my fellow commissioners wish to speak to the motion? All right, we will go ahead and vote by roll call, starting with Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Caballero. Aye. Commissioner Yesney. Aye. Uh, and I am an aye as well. 
motion passes. Uh, Vera, we'll go ahead and go back to the deferrals item. Thank you. Um, what I was going to comment on is there is a request from deferral uh, of item 5B from TAC SJ, which we can take up now or we can take it up with the item in 5B. Um, unless I hear from the fellow commissioners, uh, I would recommend we take it up under agenda item 5B. Commissioner Oliveri, you have your hand up. Is that a leftover or did you? That's a leftover, is my apologies. All right. But I concur with you. All right. Uh, fellow commissioners, anyone want to comment on whether we talk about that now or talk about it in the order on the agenda? Order on the agenda. Order on the agenda. All right. We will go ahead and do that. Thank um, you. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't skipping over that. Thank you. So the consent calendar has passed. We will go ahead and move to agenda item number five, starting with 5A. Um, and I will go ahead and kick it over to staff for a staff report. Is the staff going to be giving a report? Are you, are you getting situated? Can we can we get a sound something that gives us uh, some sense that progress is being made? Sorry about that. I didn't realize I was muted. Okay, I think we're all set. You can see, uh, see my screen and you can hear me? Yes, we're good to go. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Tracy Tan, Project Manager for Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. The project before you tonight is a mixed-use project located at 259 Meridian Avenue, and it's comprised of 226 residential units, approximately 1,400 square feet of commercial uh, ground floor commercial space, um, transportation demand management measures for parking reduction, um, and ground floor and a ground floor publicly accessible for privately maintained and owned plaza of approximately 2,200 square feet. The project site is located within the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan and is directly adjacent to single family homes that are also located within the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan. The project applicant is requesting a plan development zoning and a plan development permit. The plan development zoning is a request to rezone the property from the CO mm -hmm. Commercial Office Zoning District and the R2 Two Family Residence uh, Zoning District to a plan development zoning district. The plan development permit is a request to demolish all existing buildings on site um, to, <clears throat> to request a parking uh, reduction by utilizing transportation demand management measures and to construct a four to seven story mixed use building. Uh, this project has been analyzed with the general plan, the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan, residential design guidelines, development standards, and the California Environmental Quality Act. The project has also been found uh, to be in conformance with a number of general plan policies as detailed in the staff report and is also furthering the urban village strategy by concentrating growth where it's envisioned. Um, as mentioned, the project site is located within the West San Carlos urban village area and urban villages are where some of the growth of San Jose is expected to occur in a compact form with a pedestrian focus and transit focus. Uh, the project is consistent with the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan in that it meets the density requirements, site design features, um, and is providing a height transition to the adjacent single family homes by utilizing a series of setbacks and stepbacks um, of the project. The development standards for the project include a 20 foot setback from the northern property line for the first two floors of the building and a 15 foot setback for the third floor and above. Uh, the project is also incorporating a step back where the fifth, sixth, and seventh floors are stepped further back for the northern property line. Uh, this is probably best illustrated on sheet 7.4 of the plan development plan set. 
um, which is an attachment to your staff report. Um, access to the site is solely off Meridian Avenue and there's not gonna be any pedestrian or vehicular access to the site through Norton Avenue. Now the project is found to be in compliance with the residential design standards by providing an array of architectural features in the mid-century aesthetic and creating an interesting street, streetscape by incorporating a publicly accessible, privately maintained and owned plaza towards Meridian Avenue. Because the applicant is requesting a plan development zoning district, uh, development standards were developed for the site and is attached to the staff report as well. The development standards do allow for a building height consistent with the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan, um, which is 85 feet with an additional 10 feet to 95 feet for non-occupiable architecture features like roof forms, um, stairwells, elevator equipment, things like that. Now, the project is proposing a varying building height of 52 feet to 85 feet. Um, this is due to the um, step backs and step ups that the project is utilizing. The development standards also allow the project to utilize the parking ratios and the parking reductions through the San Jose Municipal Code. <clears throat> The project is providing 162 parking spaces, which uh, roughly equates to a 45% reduction in parking. The project is incorporating four transportation demand management measures, including bicycle parking, a monthly stipend program to each occupant uh, for like ride share services, unbundled parking, and an on-site bike share program for residents. The project has had two community meetings. Um, the first community meeting was held on May 15th of last year. And the second community meeting was held on November 21st of last year. Approximately 37 members of the public were in attendance at the first community meeting and approximately 20 members of the public were in attendance at the second community meeting. Uh, the community meeting summary or summaries, I should say, uh, is available on the project's website um, and as an attachment to your staff report as well. Uh, the project did complete an initial study and mitigated negative decorations under the California Environmental Quality Act, and all mitigation measures and environmental conditions are made part of the permit. Uh, the document was under public review from February 21st of this year to March 12th of this year, and two public comments were received. Um, comments pertaining to design and transportation were made. No new analysis was required as a result of these comments. Response to comments and all analysis are available on the city's website via the environmental um, webpage. Lastly, staff does have a clarification for condition of approval um, number 36.m.4 in the plan development permit resolution, which is exhibit B in your packet. Uh, this condition of approval is related to constructing an emergency access driveway at the northeast corner of the project site. The emergency access driveway is actually not needed because the fire department is not going to be bringing fire trucks on site um, and therefore staff recommends removal of this condition of approval. And this concludes staff presentation. I'm available for questions as, far, as well as environmental staff and public work staff. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, we'll go to the applicant and I'm not sure who that is, but I trust staff knows. Things in the works. Can we get a sign? Yeah, we do have John Moniz. Um, I'm not sure if you are the one who's going to be speaking on this item. John? You want to connect with Anthony Ho. Anthony, okay. Oops, sorry. Anthony, you are unmuted. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Great. Um, am I, do you see my screen or not yet? Do you see my screen? No. No? Okay, no. hold on. Let me go to share screen. Okay, I'm sharing screen now. Do you see my screen? Um, 
We see your name on a screen. Hmm. Hold on. Share screen. Okay. All right. You see my screen now with the blue background? We do. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I can start. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Anthony Ho, representing LPMD Architects, designer of the project. First, I would like to thank staff for working with us for the past three years. It has been a long ride for a few reasons. We had waited for the revision of the urban village plan to be finalized. We've tweaked our design numerous times to make sure we are in compliance with the plan. We've spent a lot of time on the interface with our neighbors, and we've spent time on finding the right architectural style. The site is within the West San Carlos urban village. Here is the ground floor. Meridian is to your right. The site is about 1.3 acres. We have a walkway all around with heavy landscape buffer to maintain privacy for our neighbors. At the Northeast corner, we are proposing a commercial space about 1400 square feet. We are hoping to get a bike shop there which can service the community. The leasing office is right behind. Both the leasing office and the bike shop will have direct access to a plaza that the general public can also use. Here is a blow up of that plaza. It's around 2,200 square feet. It is publicly accessible, but privately owned and maintained. This plaza would be a great place for social gathering and a stopping point for bikers. We will install benches, tables, bike racks, planters, and even public art. Besides promoting the use of bikes, this development has identified three TDM measures. First, we have unbundled parking. The cost to rent a parking space is separated from the cost of renting the apartment. Second, we will provide monthly or annual stipend for ride share or bicycle scooter rental. The amount will vary depending on the unit type and the term of the lease. Third, there will be a bike sharing program. Bicycles, including a bike cargo bike, will be placed near the lobby so the residents can easily access. Here is the second floor, is the upper level parking. Parking ratio is 0.5 for studios and 2.0 for two bedrooms. Bike shop parking is five per 1,000 square feet. As for bicycles, it's one per four units. Here are all the secured bike racks. There are 57 of them. This is the third and the fourth floor. This is where the units begin. We are proposing a total of 226 units. 206 of them will be studios under 400 square feet. 20 will be two bedroom units close to 800 square feet. There are two landscape courtyards on the third floor. Here are some images of what the courtyards might look like. Here is the fifth floor. The brown areas are the roofs. The building tapers back on the north end to stay further away from the homes on Northern Avenue. Here's the two top floors. The building is seven stories. These upper floors are pushed back even more. Here is a section cut showing how the building steps down. This is an earlier version. This is a later version in which the building steps down more. And now that's the final version. You can see how the building steps down even more dramatically. The result looks like this along Meridian. In fact, to arrive at this architecture, we got a lot of input from planning. We've been asked to design a building with mid-century architecture to blend into the neighborhood. So we did a lot of research on mid-century buildings and we, create in, we integrated all of the elements. Staff is happy with this result. And in our community meetings, a number of residents have told us they like the architecture. I also want to emphasize that we have 15% PMOs. They will be built on site. 14 units will be 50% AMI and 20 units will be 80% AMI. We've already worked this out with housing department. 
Besides offering BMRs, the product itself is affordable by design. 91% of the units are under 400 square feet. And as the unit gets smaller, rents get cheaper. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask real quick uh, if my fellow commissioners have any questions of the applicant before we um, go to the public. And seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and um, uh, open it up for public comment. It looks like we have three hands raised at this point. So staff, would you like to take charge and unmute folks? Alex Shore, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Good evening, commissioners. This is Alex Shore representing Catalyze SV. Want to thank Strangers Properties. They have been working with us, a community-based organization on our members since 2018 on this project. They've come to our project advocacy committee three times to present their project. And that project has scored higher and higher based on our members' review of it. We are absolutely delighted to see more housing coming into our community, uh, to have a public plaza, the transit demand management or transportation demand management measures that they're taking are fantastic. We're really, really excited. And the low parking ratio we think will be very important to help the city achieve its goals on sustainability and mobility. Uh, we would, of course, like to see some things, but we're uh, some more things, but we're extremely happy with the project as it is. Things we might ask for would be more bike parking spaces. If there is ability to use stacked parking spaces, one on top of each other, so that we could get additional space for homes. And we would love to see some more green features that will make the project more sustainable. There is an outstanding issue that we would like to ask the developer and staff to make 100% clear. When we evaluated the project, we did not know about these 15% of affordable housing units on site. That is something that generally speaking, our members support, and we would have scored this project probably even higher had we known about that when we did our last score in February 2020. So you received eight emails from our members bringing up that issue, and we would appreciate if staff would affirm the uh, applicant's comment about 15% on site so that it's on the public record from staff's perspective, because we didn't see it in the staff report that was submitted to you all. Thank you so much for your- Sorry about that. Uh, Joe Harity, you are up next. Please begin to speak. Okay, looks like, I hope you all, you all can hear me. Um, greetings, commissioners. My name is Joe Harity. I'm a resident of District 6, just down um, the street from this development um, on Park Avenue. Uh, and I'm here to say yes in my backyard. Um, to be clear, I strongly encourage the commission to approve this project unanimously and to give a strong thumbs up to smart, sustainable development throughout San Jose and District 6. I think this project nicely complements the development in the Midtown area and continues to focus density appropriately. Uh, specifically, I appreciate the commitment to less cars. Um, the project encourages alternative ways of getting around to offset building less parking. I find it imp uh, important that parking slots are at a 45% um, percent ratio in terms of uh, slots to units. And I'm particularly happy about the unbundling of parking. Um, and given that San Jose, uh, has a massive housing shortage um, to the tune of many thousands of units less than current demand. I'm glad to see a substantive number of homes um, at 226, and I'm particularly happy that 206 are micro units and that 15% are below market rate. Um, in my day job, I work with communities impacted by poverty, particularly uh, young adults, and we know the impacts of um, the exorbitant rents in Silicon Valley. Um, on uh, their current living conditions and their future chances um, to achieve economic prosperity in our community. Uh, this is the kind of smart step forward. Lastly, um, I appreciate the developer's commitment to engaging with Catalyze SV and demonstrating a willingness to be responsive to community. 
I, I would like to see a few subtle changes, more bike parking spaces, more sustainable green features, but on the whole, encourage the commission um, to approve this project. Thank you. Okay, we have a caller who's called in with the last three digits of 820. Please state your name for the record. You are unmuted. Hi, my name is Mr. Rivera, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Rivera, you said? Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, I live near, near the, the property and I mean, uh, I think my, my biggest concern is the parking. I know everyone's touting that, hey, you know what, that uh, there's gonna be a lot of biking uh, available, which is great, but uh, as far as the number of parking, it's gonna heavily impact the residents that live nearby. Uh, there's already no parking on Meridian Avenue. The street actually narrows right before this property starts um, with 226 units, but only 152 parking spaces. I think a lot of the new residents will be parking in the neighborhood, which is going to further limit the parking and maybe even mean that we may have to restrict parking down the road, such as having special permit parking or whatnot. And after hearing also that, you know, uh, parking is actually going to be the additional cost in addition to the rent, I think that even gives me more concern. Um, again, I think it's great that the, we're building this urban village, but I think the parking issue needs to be addressed because if, if not, new residents are going to spill onto the neighboring streets. Um, also, there's no access to on Northern Avenue, which means there's going to be more traffic going in and out of the uh, building on Meridian Avenue. Uh, like I mentioned, the biggest concern is the, the street is very narrow at that area. Um, it's one way each way. Uh, there's no access on Northern Ave. Uh, it's right next to single family homes, which again will impact their uh, parking out in the street. So again, it's a great plan, but I, I think they need to work on uh, more parking for vehicles and maybe even increasing the number of bike racks, which is great. But again, parking issue for vehicles is the biggest concern. Thank you. Uh, we, next, we have Sean McFeely. You are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Sean McFeely, and I am a member of Catalyze Silicon Valley, um, and I wanted to speak on this project. Um, I, I wanted to compliment um, Strangest, uh, the developer, for meeting with Catalyze many times and hearing our concerns and making uh, improvements and working with us towards uh, a project that we feel um, is a great addition to the city. Um, I wanted to commend them for, you know, we have a housing crisis and they're bringing a, a high quantity of housing, which is sorely needed in San Jose, and they're bringing it in hopefully at a price point that many people in the city may be able to afford. Um, if this is not luxury housing, I want to compliment them on that. Um, I also want to compliment them for the low parking ratio. I wish that they could add more bike parking and, and definitely do some more um, things to promote uh, transit and biking and other non-solo uh, car modes of transportation. Um, but where they are, it's still a great addition to the city and I want to compliment them for that. Um, I, I also am still, I am like Alex, a little confused on the affordable housing that is part of the project. Um, affordable housing thing that's built on site is a really important thing both for our housing crisis and producing low income housing, but it's also critical that we locate these housing units um, throughout the city um, in order to create inclusive communities. And so I wanted just to stress the importance of inclusive affordable housing built on site um, and if staff can clarify that that would be great, but um, I appreciate uh, the developer uh, meeting with us many times and look forward to uh, future projects with them. Thank you. We have Gavin next. Gavin, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, my name is Gavin Laurie, um, and I am also involved with Catalyze SV and uh, at the same time a student at San Jose State. Um, and looking at, I, I want to thank you for letting me um, talk about this project. And when, when I was looking at this project, the one thing I really liked about it was the micro units and the thought of, you know, now that uh, I'm getting ready to graduate, it's kind of a difficult economy. 
um, and housing is really expensive, this is the, the type of unit that, you know, either as a student, if you want to live alone, or um, when you start your career, these are the kind of units that, that, you know, you can actually afford in Silicon Valley. So I want to commend uh, the developer for bringing these units and, and really introducing this product, which I, I really haven't seen around San Jose. Um, additionally, um, I think it's great that there's affordable housing um, included now, and I'm really excited to hear that uh, because I had heard about this project without the affordable housing, so I think that's a great addition. Um, and then the, the talking about transit and the um, limited parking that it has, um, I really, I think this is, is needed in a world where we are dealing with climate change and we are trying to um, move forward in, in a sustainable way. Um, and I really like the effort that's being taken to limit the parking. Um, the idea of a bike shop, um, I do think that there needs to be more bike parking. Um, and, and additionally, I, I would also uh, suggest that they look into providing transit passes um, because it is located right next to, uh, to uh, a bus stop that has the 23 and the 23 Rapid um, that can get you quickly to downtown San Jose or to Sunnyvale. So I think it's a great location for transit. So I would encourage um, strangers properties to look into uh, potentially pro providing transit passes to these residents. Uh, thank you very much. We have Marvel. Marvel, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Marvel? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Marvel Ang. I'm also a member of Cadillac. Generally Marvel? Hello? Hi, sorry, uh, you cut out there. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, well, I'm a member of Cali's SD and uh, just echoing some of the um, things my other members said. Um, in particular, I, I like that there's a, a lot of micro units, which I think will um, provide a price point um, that will help combat, combat the affordability and housing crisis. I think the transit um, demand management plan is um, sound. And I think, you know, projects like this is important to help build up the idea, you know, that the West Side Carlos Urban Village Plan is trying to promote. Um, and I think it's important to improve projects like this and more projects like this just so that area can get built up and that vision can um, come to fruition. Thank you. All right. Does that uh, complete our the number of folks that we have on the docket to speak, staff? Yes. All right. Uh, it looks like Gavin's hand is still up. So if he could take his hand down, that would be wonderful. All right, there we go. Um, so I'm going to invite the applicant back up um, to close this out. Yes, hi. Um, we don't have any further comments at this time, uh, unless there's any question for us. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, ask uh, my fellow commissioners if they have any questions of the applicant at this time, um, or any questions generally. And I see Commissioner Oliverio has his hand up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question for the applicant. You're, uh, obviously, the opportunity is, is a lot going on on 1.39 acres, number of units, a, a generous plaza, which we don't see of 2,000 square feet. Um, and then the uh, topic comes up of uh, more bike parking. And I want to understand the physical constraints that you may have on the site. Because I'm sure you're, you anticipated providing as much as possible, but also want to understand what, you know, how much space you're working with. And I would make the assumption you could have more bike parking, but you'd have less, less public plaza. Yes, Commissioner. Um, we have a huge bike room on the second floor garage at the corner, at the southeast corner, um, which is which was in my presentation earlier. And that room, yeah, we can look into getting a, a few more bike racks. Uh, I think that's possible. Um, 
and um, it would not be affecting the plaza um, unless we want to give the bike racks to the public to use. But if it's, we give it to the residents, then they'll be secured and they will be in that bike room that I showed. So yes, it's possible. Yes. Thank you. And then the, you. And the notion of um, a stacked parking, which is mechanical in nature, I'm making the assumption that's a, extensive redesign of your uh, of your project because the number of feet needed in the garage would probably be different than you have designed. That's correct, Commissioner. Um, yeah, it involves a lot of other, you know, uh, things besides physical height of the garage and all that. And, um, and also at this time, we don't really have much proven um, um, result from other nearby projects that is using that yet. And so that is why the ownership of this project at this time are not suggesting to use the bike, uh, the, the parking racks at this time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Yesney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, I was going to raise a question similar to Commissioner Oliverio. Um, that they're even if they don't increase the bike racks now, if um, their clientele uh, generates a high demand for more bikes, it would be good if they have room to add them at that time. And presumably that's something they would be willing to do, even if, if it means, can you double deck bike racks? Does anybody know? Yes, absolutely <laughs> can, yes. Commissioner Yesney, um, yes, uh, we are already using a two-tier bike rack. Ah. However, that bike room that we have now has a, has a little bit more horizontal space. So we can get, you know, two times whatever uh, rack that we can get. So it's already doubled. Yeah, but we can add a few more, yes. And it, it's good to have room to expand in the future if this turns out to be a big success. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good suggestions, thank you. All right, um, Vera, your hand is up. Is that a holdover or did you wanna comment on something? I'm assuming, uh, 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 all right, the hand was For some down. reason it's going up, but I'm not pushing it. So I don't know, <laughs> but thank you for asking. No worries. And Commissioner Yesney, um, you'll have to manually take your hand down too. Um, so Commissioner Bonilla. Uh, question to the applicant. Um, if I recall correctly, you had said that uh, affordable housing was at 15%. Uh, I may be off with that number. Can you give us the rationale as to how you got to that number? Um, I would like to have um, staff to explain more about this. Is there anyone from housing present here? We've actually worked this out um, with housing department and we have an approval from them, um, um, you know, on the IHO compliance. Uh, we had an email from them um, back on in early May on this. Um, the approval date was May 5th and maybe our planner Tracy, Ms. Tracy Tam can, can talk a little bit about that. I can if now's the appropriate time. I was uh, writing down a list of questions to answer later. I don't know if I should answer it now. Why don't we keep going with questions of the applicant? I'll then close the public hearing and we can have staff respond. So um, let's see, Commissioner Caballero, did you have a question for the applicant? Yes, thank you. Um, can you explain your um, that process behind how you chose your TDM measures? Oh, the TDM measures? Yes. Um, we look at, what is what we believe is the most effective um, ways, and uh, honestly, we are kind of you know in kind of a learning mode as well because um, 
we try to look at how other projects are doing, what is available out there, and how we can get the parking ratio, you know, get them to support the parking ratio that we have. So it was a, a joint effort, you know, with staff as well uh, on that. May I ask a follow-up question, Chair? Yes, you may. I grant you permission. Thank you. Um, uh, I noticed that uh, the TDM measures didn't include transit, but it does include a stipend. So I just want to clarify that it should a person choose to use their stipend to purchase transit-oriented, um, uh, like a, a bus pass or uh, something of that nature, that they would be able to do so. Yes, um, our, the stipend that we mentioned that I, I presented, um, whether it's annual or monthly, um, can be a combination of VDA smart pass and bike share, you know, such as bay wheels and all that. So um, it will be combination of some sort, which can include of what you are suggesting, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, Commissioner Oliverio, did you have another question for the applicant before we um, close the public hearing and ask staff to respond? Uh, no, I was going to be inclined to make a motion to uh, support the staff recommendation, but I'm happy to wait till after staff uh, makes a comment or answers questions. All right. All right. Thank you. Let's do that. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, staff, did you want to respond? Um, so to answer the first question about the affordable housing, so it is a condition of approval in the plan development permit resolution is condition number 35. It makes reference to um, that the permittee must execute and record their affordable housing agreement, um, memorializing the um, inclusionary housing ordinance obligations against the property. And so I do have a copy of the affordable housing compliance plan in front of you. They are proposing, I'm confirming that they are proposing to build 15% on site and 9% of these units will be at 80% AMI. 6% of these units will be at 50% AMI. Uh, the 9% translates to 20 units at the 80% AMI. And then the 6% of these units at 50% translates to 14 units. Um, in the project and based on the housing compliance plan that the housing department had issued, um, they had a couple of options to satisfy their um, uh, inclusionary housing ordinance requirements. And so one of the ways you can satisfy it is either pay in lieu, um, building them offsite um, or building them on site. And the on site obligation is at the 15%. So that's how that 15% was arrived at. Um, and I think the second question, I'll go back to my notes here. Uh, I think the second question or rather the second concern that I noted was from Mr. Rivera regarding the, um, the parking numbers and the number of residential units. Um, so because it is located in an urban village, an area that we do anticipate to see um, additional growth in terms of the residential numbers, uh, units, I should say, and then also the employment numbers. Um, these areas are also um, kind of situated where, um, you know, it's, it's envisioned to be more pedestrian friendly, more bike friendly, more multimodal. So whether that means like walking, biking, um, and also taking transit, the focus is really in those areas. And so um, they, Per the San Jose Municipal Code, they are allowed to request a parking reduction, but only upon implementation of those transportation demand management measures, or TDM for short. And so if it does come that the TDM measures, they, as part of the TDM measures that they do, they're required to submit an annual report um, to the city to make sure that those TDM measures are working and it's kind of our check. And so I, I do understand the concern of um, the, the parking concern as it relates to additional units um, being proposed in this area with limited parking on Meridian, um, abutting a single family neighborhood, but there is ultimately a balance between the city's goals on trying to densify in strategic locations, um, but also you know, be respectful to the adjacent neighborhoods that these growth areas um, are kind of situated in, or I guess next to. 
I don't think I had, I don't think I heard any other questions for staff. Great, thank you. Um, so Commissioner, uh, well, Commissioner Caballero, you have your hand up. Did you, is that a holdover? All right, so uh, Commissioner Oliverio, I think you wanted to make a motion. Yes, Chair, thank you. I'd just like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Caballero. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, uh, Commissioner Oliverio, would you like to speak to your motion? I think the planning staff summarized it very well and uh, just uh, uh, no, no other comment than that. Thank you, Chair. And Commissioner Caballero, would you like to speak to your second? Sure. I uh, just want to thank the uh, developer for working with the community to uh, do the step backs. I think that that actually really helps with the integration into the um, residential neighborhood. And I thought that the uh, design was uh, pleasing. And I also really appreciate the um, transportation constraints and uh, lower parking, more bike parking, et cetera, the TDM measures. And I think this will be a great addition to the neighborhood um, and to Midtown and definitely um, something that's necessary to continue addressing our housing shortage. So thank you. Great, Commissioner Allen. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanna uh, also echo uh, comments from other commissioners and uh, wanted to express my thanks to the city council for having the foresight and wisdom in, I believe, 2009 to pass the uh, inclusionary zoning ordinance, um, which was then held up in court for about five years um, at the cost of millions of dollars. But we now have an ordinance that allows us to enforce at least a fee for affordable housing. I'm really glad to see the applicant including it on site with this project. I agree that inclusion is the best policy, um, but I really want to thank the council for being bold um, more than 10 years ago and approving that policy, which has now been a a template and a landmark for uh, cities and municipalities across the nation. I'll be voting in favor of the motion. Thank you. And Tracy, your hand is up. Did you wanna make a comment? Oh yeah, I just wanted to clarify the motion if that includes removal of the condition of approval for third number 36 M4 to remove the um, emergency access driveway as it's not needed. Yes. Okay. And all right, I'm, I see Commissioner Caballero nodding her head as well, and even a thumbs up in the video. Um, Commissioner Yesney, did you wanna speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I wanted to say how much I like the mid-century modern design. Um, I didn't think I would, but I think it's extremely good looking and it's gonna be a positive asset in that part of San Jose. That's all. Great. And uh, I'm going to chime in here and say, I see, I, I am hard pressed to find anything to criticize with this project. It's really wonderful. I love all the bike stuff. Um, of course, I love that there's affordable housing included. Um, Commissioner Allen referenced uh, the passage of the inclusionary zoning ordinance many, many years ago. I was around doing, doing advocacy at that time. And that was then council member um, Licardo who took the lead on passing that um, in, I think it was like his first or second year. So he didn't yet um, know what a, what a controversial thing he was taking on. And so it was, it was really great to get that passed. It was very landmark. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say was, that hasn't been said is, yay that we're removing a, a curb cut. So uh, I love that. And with that, we'll go ahead and um, do a roll call. So let's see, Commissioner Yesney. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Caballero. Aye. Commissioner Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. And I am an aye as well. So motion carries. Thank you. And with that, we'll go ahead and move on to item 5B. And I'll go ahead and I'll um, ask Vera to um, center us on this issue since uh, apparently there's been a request to defer. So Vera, what do we need to know and how do we discuss this? 
I believe PAC SJ made a request um, to defer this item and the letter was submitted today and it should be in your packet or in the, in the items that were there. Um, if they desire, you may want to call them and ask them um, the reasons they're for and then make a, you know, then talk to the applicant and make a decision on that before you move forward with the hearing. All right. Um... We will follow those instructions. I'll ask if someone from PAC SJ would like to speak to their request for deferral, and then we'll ask the applicant to respond. So if staff could go ahead and uh, unmute um, PAC SJ. And actually, I have a hand up from Commissioner Oliverio. Did you want to say thank something? You. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Vera, uh, just want to understand we often receive a request for deferral uh, from members of the public. Um, quite often actually. So are you saying this is the process when any uh, one individual says, I want something deferred? Well, I think that you want to address that about whether or not you want to defer. You have a re request before you, a formal request. And so I would suggest that you that you do make a decision on that um, because you do have that an active request for deferral. And um, I think it's just better practice to do that, but you're absolutely right. We get those very, very often. Well, I just want to be consistent because well, I've never seen us where we, where someone requests a deferral and then we call up. Where I usually see the body uh, covers the item. If Sorry. they, you know, if, 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 they if they desire to discuss that, they may bring it up during public comments also. So you have the alternative of also just addressing that during public comments. Yeah, I'd just like to item. comment on that, Vera, because that's all I've ever seen is when people come up to speak, that's when they would uh, you know, speak for or against or ask for deferral or anything else. I've never seen and it where they call frankly, them up individually. And you know what, Commissioner Oliverio, if that's the preference to do it that way, that's fine. As long as they're given the opportunity to speak on their request, that's all that matters. Thank so you. Commissioner Oliveri, are you suggesting that we go ahead and have, go, go forward with the staff report, um, have the applicant come up, and then if the um, folks from PAC-SJ would like to request a deferral, they can do so as a part of public comment? Uh, yes, uh, because that's all I've ever seen, uh, ever. And so that's, I think, just stay consistent. All right. So and, and, to me, and to me, it doesn't matter so long as there's an opportunity to be heard, you can do it either way. And you know you can make the decision to move on with the hearing afterwards. You can make a decision to defer if there's a motion to do that. You can make a decision to continue here and then continue. Um, you have a number of options. All right. Um, I'm going to ask my fellow commissioner. I'm I'm going to suggest that we follow Commissioner Oliverio's uh, suggestion, um, unless I see uh, my fellow commissioners uh, express extreme displeasure. And I see um, Commissioner Yesney, you have your hand up. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, we got a bunch of letters from PAC-SJ today in the last day or two, and I thought they actually raised a couple of specific technical issues about why they should ask, why they should have a deferral. So I would, and since the staff is in a position to respond to some of those technical questions, I agree with Commissioner Oliverio that we should go ahead with the normal process of business and give the staff an opportunity to do the staff report and to respond to any new technical issues that have been raised uh, in the last 24 hours. Great, thank you. Commissioner Bonilla, did you wanna say something? No, I, I, I'm in agreement with uh, uh, Commissioner Oliverio's uh, position. All right, and, and I am too. So I think that makes uh, a majority. Commissioner Allen, did you wanna chime in or Commissioner Caballero? I'm not seeing any hands raised, so unless we hear a, a hue and a cry from those two fellow commissioners, let's go ahead and um, have staff give their report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cassandra Vanderzweep, Planning Project Manager. Before the Planning Commission this evening is a Site Development Permit, file number 18-016, to allow the demolition of nine existing on-site buildings, including candidate city landmarks, the removal of 14 ordinance sized trees, and the construction of approximately 3.79 million square foot development comprised of 24,000 square feet of ground floor retail and approximately 3.54 million square feet of office space on an 8.1 gross acre site located in downtown. 
The project site is bounded by Park Avenue, South Almaden Boulevard, West San Fernando Street, and South Market Street. The site development permit includes the includes a request for 24-hour construction and exceptions to the downtown design guidelines. Commercial, institutional, and open space uses surround the project site, including, including Plaza de Cesar Chavez to the east, commercial and hotel buildings to the north, the tech museum and offices to the south, and offices to the west. The project site is currently developed with approximately 1 million square feet of office and commercial retail uses and is referred to as City View Plaza. City View Plaza is one of the city's first redevelopment sites and the buildings on site were constructed between 1968 and 1985. The historic resource assessment prepared by archives and architecture as part of the project review identified City View Plaza in its entirety and four of the and four of the individual buildings on the site as candidate city landmarks, as well as one building as a structure of merit. All buildings on the project site, including the identified historic resources, would be demolished with this project. Therefore, a supplemental environmental impact report, referred to as SEIR, to the Downtown Strategy Environmental Impact Report was prepared for this project. The SEIR determined that demolishing the historic structures and plaza would be a significant and unavoidable impact. Additionally, the SEIR identified significant and unavoidable impacts to construction and operational air quality, shade and shadow on Plaza de Cesar Chavez, and construction and operational noise. Therefore, the project's environmental resolution includes a statement of overriding considerations. The project has a general plan land use designation down which supports a broad range of commercial, residential, institutional, and other land uses with an emphasis on establishing a de destination downtown. As analyzed in detail in the staff report, the project is consistent with the general plan land use designation, several goals and policies within the general plan, the downtown primary commercial zoning district, and the active use overlay zoning district applicable to the projects Park Avenue and West San Fernando Street frontages. The project is consistent with the majority of the downtown design guidelines. However, the project does not include, or however, the project does include a request for exceptions to six specific standards related to the project's lot size, street wall requirements, proposed surface parking lot, the development's building size, and the location of garage venting. Staff recommends approval of these exceptions because the project as a whole meets the intent of the downtown design guidelines as described in the staff report. The project emphasizes pedestrian connectivity and ground floor activation. The, development design, the development's design responds to the surrounding public open spaces and uses its interesting massing and shape to enhance the public realm as well as the downtown skyline. Specific exceptions to the design guidelines are warranted due to the site constraints such as unique the unique site shape an existing parking agreement and the surrounding neighborhood circulation patterns and surrounding neighborhood public spaces additionally the venting exception meets the intent of the downtown design guideline standard to reduce impacts of the project's venting without imp impacting the project's design or impacting the surrounding neighborhoods health and safety. Since posting the draft resolutions and staff report, staff would like to correct a statement in the staff report and resolution analysis. The analysis stated the project had already received a determination of no hazard with the FAA, which stands for Federal Aviation Administration. This is an incorrect statement. The project site had previously received an FAA determination for a different project with a height of 264 feet above grade. Those determinations were voted, voided with the submittal of this project to the FAA, and this project would be 293 feet above grade. The project is still under review with the FAA, and staff notes that this misstatement does not impact the analysis as conditions 32 through 35 in the draft site development permit resolution would require the applicant to secure FAA and navigation easement clearances for the building's height construction in conformance with the zoning district height limitations. 
Additionally, since posting the staff report and draft resolution, several comment letters have been submitted. Some comments express concerns with the project, including concerns with the removal of the historic buildings, including the Cesar Pelle designed Bank of California Sumitomo Bank Building. For ease of the rest of this presentation, I will refer to it as the Sumitomo Bank Building. Concerns regarding the alternatives analysis in the SEIR. Additionally, concerns were raised that the staff report and the draft resolutions analysis of the rejected alternatives were not supported in the supplemental environmental impact report. A petition signed by approximately 140 supporters of the for the preservation of the Sumitomo Bank building with recommendations of how the building should be reused and a request for deferral noting the receipt of the first amendment to the draft SEIR was only provided yesterday and citing concerns that assertions made in the first amendment and draft SEIR were not supported with data. In response to these concerns, staff would like to note the following. Staff sent an email to all SEIR commenters, including Ben Leach at PACSJ on Monday, May 18th, 2020, 10 days ahead of tonight's meeting, providing them with a link to the First Amendment on the city's website. Staff notes pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15124B, staff's analysis uses the project objectives identified in the SEIR in the findings for the statement of overriding consideration noted in the staff report and resolution. The CEQA guidelines make clear that the project objectives should drive the agency's selection of alternatives for analysis and approval. CEQA guidelines section 15126.6C further provides that the range of potential alternatives to the proposed project shall include those that reasonably accomplish the most basic objectives of the project while lessening one or more significant effects. One of those factors that may be used to eliminate alternatives from the detailed from detailed consideration in an EIR is the failure to meet the project's objectives. Regarding the level of detail in the alternatives analysis, case law indicates that the amount of detail required with an alternatives analysis is not subject to a precise formulation. In the Al Larson Boat Shop Inc. versus Board of Harbor Commissioners, the court explained the governing rule as follows. No ironclad rules can be imposed regarding the level of detail required in the consideration of alternatives. EIR requirements must be sufficiently flexible to encompass vastly different projects with varying levels of specificity. The degree of specificity required in an EIR will correspond to the degree of specificity involved in the underlying activity, which is described in the EIR. Thus, an EIR for the adoption of a general plan must focus on secondary effects of the adoption, but, not need, but need not be as precise as an EIR on the specific projects which may, might follow. Staff finds that the project alternatives considered for this project in the SEIR correspond to the type of project being considered and achieve the level of specificity required. required. Additionally, some of the letters received express support for the project, noting the significance of this major investment in a vital downtown block as well that is well served by public transit. Some of the comment letters also reference Mr. Wolf's comments previously provided in our staff report regarding the question of the historic significance of the site in, compa in comparison to the proposed development. Finally, the applicant team provided additional documentation such as cost analysis, real estate recommendations on office and retail spaces, sub-consultant reports on the Sumitomo Bank Building, an additional discussion on the alternatives in the SEIR by historic consultants and technical advisors for the project in response to the concerns raised by PACSJ. The applicant team is here tonight to present the project and answer any questions. In conclusion, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend adoption of the supplemental EIR resolution with a statement of overriding consideration and the site development permit resolution as proposed. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. 
All right. Um, let's go ahead and bring up the applicant for their presentation. Hello, this is Ben Trinnell at Gensler. Can you hear me? We can. Great. And uh, I'm going to be joined by Jeanette Delia. Jeanette, you are unmuted. Can you see my screen? Yes. And I'm, I'm available on video as well, if you like. <laughs> okay, so um, can we can we start? Can you hear me, Ben? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, good evening, my name is Jeanette D'Elia. I'm a San Jose native and I'm the COO of J. Paul Company. J. Paul Company is a privately held local development firm with a portfolio of over 11 million square feet of Class A office space throughout Silicon Valley. We believe the Valley's future lies in downtown San Jose and, have, and since 2018 have made a major commitment to the city by acquiring over $700 million in prime downtown real estate. Our 200 park building currently under construction is being developed on a spec basis to produce office product ahead of demand. It's a strategy we've successfully employed, even in previous challenging economic times. We hope to commence construction of City View later this year, and once finished, our combined total investment in downtown San Jose will be over $5 billion. I'd like to thank planning staff and the development services team for their professionalism throughout the entitlement process, the Planning Commission for its continued service, even during these unprecedented times. I'm excited to present City View for your consideration tonight. As you can see from the checklist, City View substantially conforms with the visions and the goals of the general plan, the downtown strategy plan, council policies, and the zoning ordinance. Next slide, please. At full build out, City View will generate 3.7 million square as 3.7 million square foot technology center, bringing over 2,600 full time construction jobs almost 32,000 direct and indirect jobs, and almost $9.1 million annually in tax revenue to the city's general fund. We believe the time to invest in the future of San Jose is now. I'd like to introduce Ben Trinnell, principal of Gensler, the project's architect. We have other subject matter experts available this evening who can address additional co uh, questions the commission may have. Ben? Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Planning Commissioners. Um, on behalf of our team, I'm Ben Trinnell. As uh, Jeanette mentioned, I'm the principal in charge of this project at Gensler, and I'm so pleased on behalf of our team to share this with you tonight. This is a transformative project that will be a landmark for San Jose. It will chart a path to a sustainable future with carbon reductions and other reductions you see here, and it will create a vibrant public realm animated by pedestrians and cyclists. The project fronts the Plaza de Cesar Chavez, the oldest public open space in California, and will be a catalyst for the city's vision to create a pedestrian-focused Park Avenue. Retail and active uses line all street edges. Service and below-grade parking access are provided at signalized intersections, secured bike rooms, and permanent bike lanes that are all part of the city's better bikeways are implemented with this project. Here you can see the central promenade and the extension of the Amadan Avenue Paseo through the site. This is the future of Park Avenue. This view you see on the screen now is what the realigned Park Avenue with the uh, ground plane connections that we're describing will create. Now I'd like to walk you around the site. We have a view here looking west towards a central plaza with space for events. 
And that central plaza will be animated with retail, active uses, vibrant planning, uh, all kinds of vibrant planting and various coloration uh, in the landscape. A generous plaza fronting onto the Plaza de Cesar Chavez at the corner of Market and Park Avenue will allow space to, uh, for events to spill out of the plaza and support that. And the front door of the project is right next to that on Market with a tall, very tall, generous lobby space that fronts the central promenade. We took full advantage of the increased height limits through the new FAA that Cassandra mentioned in her staff report. And we've shaped the ends of the buildings and offset the heights of the bridges to create a distinct dynamic skyline as you move around the project. Contextually appropriate massing with a podium height that matches the historic existing buildings around the Plaza de Cesar Chavez are also a part of the project. In addition to that, the warm tones of the terracotta we've selected reflect the warm tones of nearby buildings, such as the old post office. The plantings and landscape bring an accent color and variety to the project. The project superimposed here with the existing buildings is consistent with the city's historic landmarks preservation policy. Over the past year, we have met a couple of times with HLC and we initiated meetings with PACSJ to collaboratively, and I work together and identify ways to commemorate the building. One of those examples you see here in this digital scan, which we've already completed. We presented this at their board meeting. It was very well received. We are thrilled to work with you tonight to shape the future of San Jose as a landmark destination with a vibrant public realm and a sustainable future. Thank you very much. So with that, we will go ahead and open up the public, go, go to the public to see if there are any folks who would like to speak on this issue. And I see a few hands raised, so I'll go ahead and ask staff to start calling on folks. Okay, first we have Ben Leach. Ben, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Thank you. Uh, ben Leach, Executive Director of PACSJ. I want to speak first about our request for deferral, and then if there's time, I would like to talk about the merits of the project, but uh, first things first. Um, as you know, uh, we have long advocated for the preservation of the Bank of California building. Uh, it's an exceptional example of modern design and a unique asset to the architectural character of downtown. Uh, we have provided extensive comments on the project SEIR and its uh, consideration of the preservation alternatives. And we continue uh, to believe that those are lacking in objective substantive analysis. After the agenda materials for this meeting were distributed last week, uh, the city uh, added 232 supplemental pages that we and you as commissioners have had very little time to digest. Um, even in our rush review, we continue to see problematic claims that question uh, the assertions that the building is uh, not feasible for preservation. Um, and given that this information is the type of information that should correctly be in the SEIR itself, and given the SEIR materials are typically accorded at least 30 days for public review and comment, we are respectfully requesting that consideration of this item be deferred to a future meeting. Um, I also don't want to lose fact of the site, uh, lose sight of the fact that uh, that we're here to argue that this is important architecture. Um, every uh, every generation uh, gets to choose what it thinks is ugly and what isn't, and it's often uh, uh, second guessed by the generation that like comes after it. Um, you, you've you've heard of our Save the Sinks petition; it's very popular. Even this generation uh, is recognizing that this is a downtown asset. Uh, let's stop calling it ugly, outdated, or in the way. The next generation won't. Thank you. Next, we have Mike. Mike, you are unmuted. Yes. Uh, hey, we have met uh, Janet and Ben. They are good people, and they did share with us their vision for how they could pay tribute to the building. Unfortunately, the ultimate tribute would be actually saving the building. And uh, this project just uh, proposes to wipe out an entire city block that was funded, by the way, as the RDA's first project. And it was funded, I might add, by the people's money. 
um, the, the city's historic report, I might just add, um, clearly attributes the design of this building to Cesar Pelli, the, the same developer, the same architect that designed the Patronus Towers in Malaysia. Um, we are um, concerned that this building appears to be a monoculture mega office place, meaning potentially a single client. Um, we would appreciate if that is the case, knowing who that client is so that we can engage with that client much like other projects in San Jose have been trying to do. And we have particularly noted that there are, in a response to the downtown association question about flow of uh, individuals at street level, the subject of possibly a couple of security gates came up. And so that would imply that there is, it's not necessarily a free flow. I also wanna, in the remaining time here, bring up that um, there has been, we have addressed the alternatives as best as we can with the documents that we have. And part of the response we got was, uh, well, you aren't looking at this in three dimensions. And uh, the comment back as respectfully as we can make it is we've been asking for 3D models of buildings in the context of their surrounding buildings for as long as I can remember being, uh, you know, standing in front of this organization. So please provide a BIM model in the future for these projects so we can respond in 3D. Next, we have Lynn Stevenson. Lynn, you are unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, this is Lynn Stevenson. Um, for the record, again, I want to mention PAC's letter that was emailed to the mayor, uh, city manager, Rosalind Huey, uh, and our other council people objecting to the city proceeding with decisions about important development uh, pr uh, projects during these very difficult times. You know, we've seen a few technological issues that have come up tonight. I don't believe that regular people really have the wherewithal at this time to participate in this kind of proceeding. Um, we can't see, you. we can see you, you can't see us. Uh, staff and the city are all visible, we are not. There's no way to assess credibility or affect with this kind of technology. These decisions are going to impact the city for generations to come. There is no hurry with these problems. And as Mike uh, mentioned earlier, you know, the landscape is going to change with this pandemic you may end up with huge 3 million square feet of commercial space that cannot be rented if Facebook or some other tenant decides that they're not going to come to downtown San Jose. After all, because everybody is going to work at home, the city needs to proceed with caution. Um, the residents need notice. Uh, they need an opportunity to be heard. I want to be sure that the letter that PAC sent that they emailed on April 20th is made part of the record on this uh, agenda item. Thank you very much. Next, we have Andre. Andre, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, I need to address the topic of, par topic of parking. So much of the discussion on this project's feasibility surrounds the assumption that five levels of underground parking are required to be built and the expense associated with holding back dirt under the Bank of California building while excavation occurs for all of those levels. As you probably know, the state and the city have pivoted towards emphasizing vehicle miles traveled or VMT. The Envision 2040 general plan contains goals and policies for transportation. And one such policy includes reducing the amount of drive alone commute trips by as much as 40% while increasing transit by at least 16% and bicycle commuting by about the same percentage. Alternatives to driving also promote healthful community goals and Vision Zero San Jose. The project is less than a three quarters of a mile from Deard on BART, a 15 minute walk. It is less than a half mile to BART downtown, an eight minute walk. Convention Center and First Street light rail stations are between a quarter to a half mile from this project or approximately seven to eight minutes on foot. With this incredible opportunity to, to, for transit options, reductions in vehicle miles traveled can be achieved if accommodations for office parkers are reduced. 
why are we not insisting on taking advantage of this site's location? Other centrally located office and residential developments have applied for and been granted greatly reduced requirements for on-site parking, both for tenants and public use, using close access to transit as their justification. By requiring fewer parking spaces, many project options open up that could include fewer underground levels in total. Second mark or going down fewer levels adjacent to Bank of California, possibly reducing shoring costs. Reduced parking requirements therefore enable additional project alternatives that heretofore have not been analyzed as part of the environmental process. Please address the parking proposed for City View Plaza. Thank you. Next we have Peter Bennett. Peter, you are muted. Peter, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Are you sure he's unmuted? He should be, yes. Unmute now. Now can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to the commission for hearing my comment. I wanted to call out some numbers that I found in the SEIR. The project has uh, the, the area currently has around 750,000 square feet of office, and the proposed project has 3.6 million square feet of office. That is an increase of 4.8 times the square feet of office. If Then if you look at the number of parking spaces, there's 898 today, and the project proposed has 6,230, which is uh, a multiplier of 6.9. And the LTA analysis, uh, predicts that uh, the current project has 270 uh, morning trips uh, coming in, and the proposed project has 2,908 morning trips, which is a multiplier of 10.8%. So to sum those up, the project is increasing the office square footage by 4.8 times, the parking spaces by 6.9 times, and the trips by 10.8 times. So trips and parking spaces are over, uh, are over delivered compared to the square footage of office. That seems backwards. Um, the project should not be allowed to generate more car trips and add more parking spaces than the number of square feet of office that they're adding. Uh, I have some ideas. If the project does have to uh, provide the parking with five underground stories, maybe some of it can be held out of circulation and if the commissioners are interested in those ideas, I can share them. But again, I see this as being, uh, having a lot of extra parking provided, and this would be an opportunity to do something like a parking maximum, although we don't have that in San Jose. Uh, so this is an important decision, and there's uh, just those numbers show that the parking is being over provided compared to the square footage. Thank you. Next, we have Nate. Nate, you are unmuted. Nate? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thank you. My name is Nate LeBlanc. I'm the business development manager for the San Jose Downtown Association. Our D downtown design committee uh, reviewed this project and I believe 2019, but it's hard to remember now that time doesn't matter anymore. Um, and we also contributed some comments on the SEIR. I'm here tonight to support this proposal and to thank Jay Paul for their investment in downtown San Jose and their vision for downtown San Jose. This is obviously a huge project and with its scale comes a considerable amount of um, concern and we recognize that but I think that this investment and this multiplying effect on the available office space in downtown San Jose is something we've envisioned for a long time and we feel that it's now coming true and we need to support that and welcome that into our business community. Of course um, there's the controversy surrounding the courthouse. Our public position has been that we're okay with it being removed from the site and that the um, scan and the kind of uh, memorial to it are more than sufficient to bring it up. I realize that probably not a lot of people on this call are going to agree with that, but that is our position. Um, so we, we do have some concerns about the public access. I don't think that's the, the kind of thing that should hold up a decision of this magnitude. We welcome this 
development coming into downtown, providing so much tax revenue, so many jobs, and we appreciate your careful consideration of what's in front of you tonight. Thank you for your time. Okay, next we have Kelly Snyder. Kelly, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Kelly Snyder, and I'm a resident in San Jose. And although I am heavily involved in a number of civic endeavors, I'm speaking on my own behalf tonight. Uh, me and my family frequently go downtown. We tend to bike, and we usually ride along Park Avenue from the west side into downtown. Um, it is our preferred bike route because of the buffered bike road, uh, bike, ro uh, bike lane under the tracks. I think this project is really beautiful. I really love what Jay Paul is proposing at City View. Um, it's going to bring unprecedented private investment into downtown with, with almost no public subsidy, which is fantastic. And I really look forward to them improving Park Avenue in this block. The building that's being proposed for demolition is, quite frankly, ugly. Um, that's that's absolutely true. And many people agree with that. The primary value of that building possibly the only value of it is to maintain it for this tiny little audience of esoteric architectural history buffs. I, I get that there's something of intrinsic value there, but even the guy who built it, Mr. Wolf, says he doesn't care about that. In contrast, the new proposal that Jay Paul is proposing is going to benefit many, many thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people by narrowing Park Avenue and adding the activated street space, all the visitors who come to the tech museum and watch the ball machine, Christmas in the park, wandering out after a show at the Center for Performing Arts are going to benefit from the new Paseo and street and sidewalk connections that are being proposed. And there are other ways to commemorate the, brutal, the brutalist building. Thanks. So I hope the Planning Commission will allow the proposal to go forward as proposed. Thank you very much. Next, we have Dylan Bolt. Dylan, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Thank you, Danielle. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. My name is Dylan Bolt. I'm with uh, Local 43, the Sprinkler Fitters. I'm um, speaking on behalf of myself and the rest of Local 43 San Jose residents. We support the City View project. This project is a collaboration of the union workers and a developer who cares about the community and the members that live in it. This developer is supporting union construction workers and our families by working with us. They do this because unions in San Jose support the livable wage while holding up the best safety records to date. With this project coming to San Jose, it will bring much needed tax revenue. And by working with the local unions, we ensure that that money paid to the construction workers while building this project will stay in our community. It's important for us to remember that when we're discussing these projects. Um, this is a much needed project for San Jose and uh, Local 43 and myself, we stand in support of it. We hope that the commission will vote yes on this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Jean. Jean, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Good evening, Planning Commission. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Jean Cohen, and I'm speaking for the 3,000 members of UA Local Union 393, workers in the plumbing, piping, and HVAC industries. I'm also a proud resident of downtown San Jose, and I regularly utilize Park Avenue as a safe bike route. Construction is currently a bifurcated industry split into two business models. The high road model in which companies compete on productivity, efficiency, timeliness, and quality of work, and the low road model in which companies compete primarily by paying their workforce as little as possible. This dichotomy means that whether or not employment growth produces family supporting careers depends on which road we, as a city in San Jose, 
decide to take. Tonight, we can take the high road with partners like the Jake Paul Company and Level 10, responsible developers working in partnership to build magnificent projects while also providing wages and benefits that support a sustainable family wage. Local 393 supports this project and requests that you certify the EIR and approve the site development permit tonight. Thank you. Okay, next we have Will. Will, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Good evening and thank you. My name is Will Smith. I'm a business agent for IBEW Local 332. We're 3,600 plus members in Santa Clara County. I'm thrilled to offer support uh, for the adoption of the City View project. This project here will, will employ hundreds of local construction workers that'll build this project on a family sustainable wage. We know San Jose is very, very expensive to live. And so you need a family sustainable wage to, 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 to provide here for your family. And Jay Paul is more than willing to, to, to do that. Now more than ever before, it's important that, that we have health care. We know that the, the climate that we're in. And so not only will they provide a skilled and trained workforce, but will provide a safer um, working conditions. And so safety is at its utmost uh, importance right now in the time that we're in. When the developers and the local union workforce, they collaborate on shared goals of responsible development, projects can be completed on time and on budget. And they can do this with a local hire, as well as a training, a training apprentice. Um, college isn't necessarily the, the path for everyone. And so if you do, don't choose college, uh, a union apprenticeship is a great way to go. And it provides a um, family sustainable wage. So we, we hope that uh, you definitely adopt and approve the City View Development Project. And thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Dominic. Dominic, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Dominic? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. I, um, good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Dominic Toriano, and I'm a business representative for Sheet Metal Workers Local Union 104. Please approve the City View development application tonight. The project demonstrates a collaboration among developers and construction workers who build high quality projects that hire local workers and create pathways to good jobs for women, youth, and veterans. The project will transform Park Avenue and generate millions of dollars in tax revenue while creating good paying local jobs to grow and sustain a vibrant middle class. Now more than ever, the city of San Jose needs to support reasonable, sorry, responsible developers with the resources to build these types of high rise commercial projects. The City View project is a good project for our city and should be approved tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have Kurt. Kurt, you are unmuted. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, my name is Kurt Chacon. I'm a, a resident of San Jose. I've uh, lived here uh, for 59 years. Um, I've seen the changes of San Jose um, over the years, but I've also been here long enough to watch San Jose miss booming economies. Um, and we're in a time now where we've had an economic boom. San Jose is finally um, growing up, um, turning into a vibrant downtown. And this City View project would just be uh, uh, the, the pinnacle of, of downtown San Jose. Uh, J. Paul um, Company has built a number of Class A um, campuses um, here in the Bay Area that are um, beyond what you normally would see out of a developer. Um, and I think, I think it's something that uh, San Jose would, uh, would be um, totally disappointed if for some reason if this didn't go through. 
primarily why I'm, I'm, I'm calling is regarding the uh, Bank of California building. Um, uh, I, I understand that there's some historical feelings behind the architecture of this building. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that look at that building more as um, a place of a lot of pain as it was the family court for many, many years um, and just brought many, many bitter memories. Um, and I don't think that, I don't think that will ever be overlooked. Um, and I hope that uh, we don't let this block of concrete become the eyesore 15 second mark. landmark for the city of San Jose. Thank you. Next, we have George. George, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, good evening. My name is George Pineda. I'm a graduate of uh, Local 332 in San Jose, uh, IBW Apprenticeship Program. Uh, the opportunity to work on projects like City View has positive impacts on my life and for my family. Developments like this will ensure other apprentices have the same opportunities for job training and healthcare benefits, in my opinion. Uh, I'm speaking in support of the City View project because it will be built by a developer that hires a skilled and trained workforce to ensure the best product. This means the workers on this job will receive fair wages and healthcare benefits. Even though all construction workers in San Jose should have access to good wages and benefits, many don't which is why my union supports this project by Jay Paul. Thank you for considering this project and please vote yes to support the proposal. Thank you. Next we have Gail. Gail, you are unmuted. Please begin to speak. This is Gail, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I strongly oppose this project for many reasons. Architectural significance, the important world-renowned designer and the architectural firms, historical significance of San Jose's first urban renewal project for RDA, an excellent example of mid-century financial center and the horrific waste of demolishing all these buildings in the plaza. But my most urgent plea is at the very minimum to save the historic and unique Pelly building, which we like to call the San Jose Sphinx. Visitors to San Jose and residents would enjoy viewing and entering a unique structure exhibiting a style from the past among all the glass towers we seem to be proliferating throughout our downtown. I urge the commission to not recommend certifying the EIR, which I feel has errors and has not thoroughly explored all the options, and to um, recommend that this proposed project not move forward at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Next we have um, P. Mahoney. You are unmuted. If you could state your first name for the record. Sure, I'm Phil Mahoney. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. So I've been a broker for over 35 years here in the Valley and I've worked with Jay Paul Company for decades and I've represented um, many of the largest tenants in the Valley and their campuses and many of the largest developers uh, throughout San Jose as well as other cities throughout the Valley. And I wanted to address just two quick points. One would be that uh, there was a concern about parking and maybe there is too much. I think uh, in our new world, uh, not everyone is gonna wanna get on a uh, Duradon train right now. Not everyone's gonna wanna get on a bus right now. So unfortunately, like it or not, we're somewhat still wed to the automobile and large corporate users that'll bring a myriad of benefits for the downtown, uh, market as well as for San Jose in general will need that parking. Um, the other thing that I think needs to really be addressed is the comment about the uh, reception of the building to tenants. This is exactly what tenants of today want, not tenants of 1960, 70, or 80. 
this is a functionally uh, unique development and one that I think Gensler has really gone up and over the top. It's a sort of landmark that will for decades to come put San Jose on the map and be able to have uh, the downtown have the iconic, iconic structure that it really needs to have to say, oh, that's where it is, there's city view. So it's something that I think the city can be proud of for decades to come and it will attract, if not one, but perhaps many tenants to the multiple buildings there. So I think uh, it'd be best for all involved for this project to be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our speakers. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who um, uh, commented on the project. With that, we will bring the applicant back to close us out with a five minute presentation, if they so desire. Um, <clears throat> Hi, sorry, I'm a little disheveled. Um, we believe the time to invest in the future of San Jose is now. We're actively talking to prospective tenants who are establishing their post COVID strategies. And you know, timing is everything. San Jose is known for working at the speed of business and it's critical to our entitlements that they remain on schedule. We started the City View entitlement process in the fall of 2018 and have been working diligently with staff throughout the time to bring the city a world-class project that will be an economic engine and truly establish San Jose as the capital of Silicon Valley. We proactively met with PACSJ on three separate occasions, including a presentation to their full board and to listen to their concerns, explore alternatives and a meaningful way to commemorate the Bank of California building. This is not required by the city um, by their outreach policy, but we felt it was the outreach was really important. The building has also been before and addressed by the HLC on five separate occasions with the first presentation in April of 2018 in connection with an application submitted by the previous owner of City View. We have, <clears throat> we have brought with us tonight additional supporting materials that were submitted to the public record as well as detailed analysis we previously shared with PACSJ and have in attendance our structural engineer and other subject matter experts um, that the planning commissioners uh, are, are, uh, will answer any questions that you have. As we continue to talk to prospective tenants, it's critical that our hearings remain on schedule as any deferral will be detrimental to the feasibility of the project and how San Jose positions itself in the Valley as it comes out of the COVID crisis. Thank you for your time and consideration, Planning Commissioners. Ben, do you wanna chime in? Uh, yeah, um, I would like to just share a little bit more. Um, uh, maybe there's a few more images that I can share because we gave you a very brief overview in the last um, presentation. So let me know if you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you again for your time this evening. Um, just wanted to uh, take a few more minutes and, and, and briefly uh, share a few additional images that we didn't have time to get through in the first round. And again, as Jeanette mentioned, we're happy to uh, spend any more time uh, explaining or answering any of your questions. Uh, this view here you see is from inside the lobby space that I showed the exterior of before, and it's looking back out towards the Plaza de Cesar Chavez you can see the uh, promenade, very large uh, possibility for very large openings, uh, this kind of stair, very grand stair that goes up and we can see the Fairmont Hotel across the way there. Uh, if we step outside through that glass, we see this view here with this active edge, this detail around facing on to uh, the, the, the Market Street uh, space um, with these kinds of uh, stairs that go up onto the next level and create opportunities for people to gather and see and be seen and the kind of excitement that can be generated by a sense of place. Uh, and in this view, this is uh, looking through the Paseo that connects Almaden, the Almaden Paseo to the north. Um, and you know, we think this is a very important through connection. This is uh, open uh, all the time uh, as the project 
projects uh, being proposed right now. You can see the bridges up above that are two-story height, uh, very transparent. These are naturally ventilated spaces to give the people inside a different kind of space to step into uh, from uh, office space to this type of bridge passing space. And uh, it creates a very open, transparent connection. So this will be a space that people feel like they can stop, pause, use the retail, gather, have a bite to eat, sit on the bench, and then continue up through uh, the connection at the ground floor. And you can see here a little bit more of the very warm earth tone terracotta that we're proposing. This is a view that I mentioned in the earlier presentation, this massing that we tried to make appropriate and responsive to the context uh, around the plaza. And this is a view from on top of that podium. And this is indicative, the project is covered with terraces. There are many, many outdoor terraces throughout the entire development. The kind of green space that we put into the street is continued through the tower. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, this is an image of standing inside of one of these bridges. And we just think this is an exhilarating moment within the project where you're looking, um, you have the opportunity to, to look out and feel connected to the outdoors through these bridges. Again, these are naturally ventilated spaces, so they increase the sustainability of the project. And uh, you, you see through this image, you see the 200 park project, which uh, Jeanette mentioned at the very beginning, which is the project that is already broken ground. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I just wanted to share a few more images that we didn't quite have time to see before that give you a, hopefully a little bit um, more context and a better glimpse inside of the project. We're again, really proud to be uh, designing and building this landmark for San Jose that I think does present the city an opportunity to make history and, and to define the future tonight. So thank you again. All right, um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and um, ask if staff would like to respond to anything that was mentioned in the public comment. Yes, thank you, Commissioner ba or Chair Ballard. Um, sorry, I assume there might be questions for uh, the applicant. So I'm quickly scrolling through my notes. Um, Regarding the comments um, about the pedestrian, um, potential pedestrian gate, um, there is a um, condition of approval included in the proposed uh, draft uh, site development permit resolution, which would allow a, um, a planning permit adjustment to put in security gates along the east-west Paseo. Um, however, it would only be permitted to be, sorry, let me grab those, that timing. It would have limited, limited hours of 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. Um, so the security fence would be located on the east-west Paseo, but public access would be required to be maintained throughout the entire site, including that east-west Paseo from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, the only exception we put to that was if there was a special event occurring on the site in which they would obtain a special event permit through the city's normal process. Regarding the proposed um, or the potential for further parking reductions, um, I did want to note that the applicant is um, utilizing a 20% parking reduction. This isn't the maximum that they but they are um, proposing to reduce their parking some. Um, as the downtown zoning ordinance is currently written, um, a previous commenter stated there is no parking maximum, and so they would be in compliance with the parking requirements and utilizing that reduction. They're also utilizing a strategy of parking lifts, parking valet, um, and alternative parking arrangement to accommodate all those spaces. So it is a lot of spaces and it is a five level subterranean parking garage, but it also is achieved through this alternative design. So if they weren't using the alternative design, it would be even more levels of underground parking. Um, 
with that, um, I'm not sure if Rima Mahamu, the environmental planner, wanted to add any additional comments. Sorry, I had a little trouble unmuting myself. No, I have no comments to add. With that, we're happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. All right, so at this point, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions uh, from my fellow commissioners. And I see Commissioner Yesney's hand up. Of course. Um, I actually have a question for the applicant. Um, when one looks at the elevations for this project, it appears to be composed of flat top glass boxes. But in fact, it's actually a very complex design and I like a lot of it. But the, the architect made a couple of references to efforts they made to um, enhance the roof line. And having flat top buildings in the middle of San Jose, we have plenty of them. We don't need a whole lot more. But I would like if the architect could perhaps explain how the um, massing and orientation of the buildings, which I understand is um, intended to change the perception of the roof lines, how that's going to work. Okay, go back, because I was- Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that question. Thank you very much. Um, I can uh, share an additional diagram with you as well, if that would be helpful. Yes. Uh, and bear with me, I'm quickly becoming a Zoom expert, although I wouldn't go that far. Uh, so um, yeah, so we appreciate your comment. Uh, this, this series of diagrams, I hope, explains how we uh, ex thought about the project um, early on. And what this is showing is a somewhat kind of conventional massing, um, and then the idea of how you could connect those towers. You might have multiple towers on the site, how you would start to connect them. Uh, and then the idea of how we would, with the an an analysis of the massing, make it responsive to solar orientation. Uh, so there are purposeful adjustments to this, as well as breaking down the scale in a meaningful way. So part of that is making it relevant to the data around the site. And I mentioned that about the podium that's responsive around the Plaza de Cesar Chavez. Uh, you can see that a consistent thread all the way around the project at about that 50 foot high uh, line in the in the right top right image. Uh, and then the the other element of this massing is that the ends of these uh, rectangular forms are chamfered in plan. And what that creates is the possibility that when you look down the the street, when you look down Park. Uh, Avenue or any of the other streets that you see not just a straight line that's the top of the building, but that there's a distinctive skyline there. And I think I shared a couple of those images before. Um, and let me just go to uh, perhaps one or two more that might that might show that as well. Um, one moment, please. Let me pull that up. Okay, um, I think this view, which I shared before, um, illustrates what uh, what the what the massing is doing. So these buildings, while they're all the same height, because of the chamfered ends on the plan, uh, we're seeking to create that uh, that profile in that skyline. So, uh, and then the the other element is I mentioned that the bridges that connect the buildings they don't go all the way to the top. They go up to one story below. So these bridges um, make it possible that you see more uh, variation as, as one walks around the building. But I, I wanted to um, assure you that we're very sensitive to, to the remark. I think uh, Rod Diridon, uh commented to me once that 
you know, we need to extend the height of buildings in San Jose so we don't have all the buildings at the same height. So we're glad that we were able to take advantage of the FAA height increase on this project as well. Ho hopefully that helps to answer your question. Yes, it does help. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that all? All right. I see that Commissioner Yesney muted herself. I'm going to take that as an indication that that was uh, all she had to ask. Um, uh, Commissioner Allen. Thank you, Chair. I just had a, a quick question. First, I'm sorry, two quick questions for staff. First, regarding um, the loan community meeting that was held for this project. I, um, I understand that time is short <laughs> and uh, time is money, but um, one community meeting for um, this scale of a project, I found, and only 15 members of the community attending. Could you please comment as to the outreach strategy that was used or the, the decision to only hold one community meeting? Was there just lack of interest? It seems like there's quite a bit of interest in this project from the community and a number of others who've spoken tonight. Um, so I think we had at least 15 speakers tonight. So could you com could staff comment on why only one meeting was held and um, why only 15, why perhaps explain why only 15 people attended? Yes. Um, so the one meeting was held um, in conformance with the city council community outreach um, policy, which um, requires the one um, meeting in coordination with the planning department. Um, this meeting was also a scoping meeting. Um, so beyond the standard notification of everyone within a thousand feet of the project site, um, it was also um, the project's notice of preparation was released ahead of the meeting. Um, to inform uh, other stakeholders in the city who typically get the, these notifications. Um, additionally, um, as kind of was in, um, hinted before, there was a project, a much smaller project on just the Sumitomo Bank building site. Um, and that community meeting, um, I was the project manager, only had three people in attendance. So the fact that we received once the project signs went up, and um, at the community meeting itself, um, there wasn't an enormous amount of um, community input. We did, however, receive quite a bit of community input um, from the historic community in particular. And this project, um, this specific project, went to the HLC Historic Landmarks Commission for early referral in September. And then uh, we went again for comments during the public circulation of the draft SCIR. Um, in May, um, on May 1st, sorry, on April 1st, mixing up my dates. Um, hope, hope that helps clarify. Absolutely. I mean, by the, by the book, it clarifies um, and answers the question. I feel like this project merits uh, more in terms of community engagement and public outreach. It's a very, I mean, I think it's a fabulous looking project. It's just very large scale and it is going to have quite a significant impact on a variety of stakeholders. Um, I appreciate that not all of them can attend meetings, and I also appreciate that not all of them live, with, live or work within a thousand feet of the project, and I also appreciate for our previous discussions of council policy 630 that it's entirely lacking, and it's not your fault at all, Cassandra, nor is it the fault of the planning department that is entirely a council decision, it's their policy. So I'll just go on the record as saying again that council policy 630 is obviously decidingly lacking. Uh, second question, I note um, as a former arts commissioner, uh, and a member of San Jose Arts Advocates on the side. I will note that um, I do enjoy the the um, condition that 50% of the c construction barriers be decorated with art uh, during the project. I would only ask the uh, developer or the applicant be open to 100% of the barriers being, uh, having art applied to them. I think that would be fabulous. Um, so that's all my only comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, I'm going to put myself in the queue. Chair? Yep. Uh, yes. Did you? I don't see your hand up. Would you like to say something? I lost my raise hand uh, functionality, <laughs> so I'm back to verbal. All right, go ahead, and then I'd like to uh, ask some questions after. And I want to make it clear, also, if folks have um, questions of the applicant, we can always unmute the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to confirm again with planning staff that. During the EIR process, uh, responses were provided to every question and nothing heard uh, now is, uh, is anything unexpected or unanswerable. This is Rima Mahamud with Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. 
um, I'm the environmental project manager, and that is correct. We received eight letters during the public comment period, and we responded to all of the comments in those letters, and that's posted in the First Amendment to the SEIR. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to comment that I actually did attend the community meeting, and these are the types of meetings that I actually uh, really enjoy because it has professional planning staff leading the meeting, uh, managing the meeting. Uh, what I don't care for meetings that are not with planning staff where urban myth is spread and falsehoods are spread. So I appreciate uh, staff's work on this item and having the community meeting. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions of the staff, and some of them might be more appropriate for the applicant also. Um, first, I wanted to ask about the um, some of the transportation elements of the project. And, and I want to say, just also for the record, this looks wonderful. I'm excited. Um, I look forward to supporting something that goes forward on this site that's going to really help further San Jose and downtown San Jose is a great place to live, work, and play. Um, uh, that said, I had some questions about the um, egress and ingress uh, associated with the project, and it goes back to my comment about the uh, Meridian project. I, I am interested in reducing the number of curb cuts um, because, in part, we are, as uh, someone, I think Andre Luther commented on, um, we have some pretty bold goals when it comes to shifting how we're transporting ourselves and um, the downtown area and in particular around Deerdon is going to have to like triple or quadruple those goals in order to make up for the rest of the city that will lag behind. You know, Almaden Valley isn't going to be able to get the big mode shift goals that downtown can. So we're going to have to stretch real hard here. Um, and so that makes this kind of project really important because it is very with 6,000 parking spaces. I think that's what it is. It's a, someone described that as a parking bomb. That's a whole lot of parking. Um, so with that as the context and knowing what I know about San Fernando and the fact that this is considered one of our major bike corridors, we've been investing in the bike infrastructure on San Fernando to get people um, to use that as a bike greenway. Um, it's got a lot of green paint, it's got a lot of new infrastructure. We have a grant to be um, making it even better. Um, so on that San Fernando side, there it looks like, and maybe staff can just start by clarifying, it looks like there's two driveways um, on the San Fernando side. I have that correct? I see yes. some pattern. Yep. Um, and I understand that they're both signalized, correct? With the project, they will be. Um, so can, can you just talk a little bit about the rationale behind that, given, again, that San Fernando is um, a place where we're investing a lot of money to make that a, a fantastic corridor between downtown and the Deerdon station for bicycles in particular? Um, I know that there's, you know, a raised bike path there, and that's really exciting, but I am concerned as someone who commutes along San Fernando frequently on my bike, um, that even though we've got a ton of green paint there and we're, we're doing a lot to make it feel stress-free by having bollards there, there's still a tremendous number of stoplights. And we can call it a bike boulevard all we want, but if as a bicyclist I've got to stop every two blocks and stop and start and it takes me forever to get through downtown San Jose, I'm not going to use San Fernando, even though we're calling it one of our best bike boulevards. So it, it seems to me, based on what my understanding of that side of the project, that we're kind of working at cross purposes. We're investing in the in the in San Fernando as a vital bike corridor, and at the same time, kind of shooting ourselves in the foot with this um, interface between this building and um, and San Fernando. So I, for, I guess I just want to make sure I have that right. Um, and if so, I'd love for staff to just comment on other options you explored and why we have to do things that way here on San Fernando and we can't rely on you know, some other entrances and exits. Sure, I'll begin. And then we do have our Department of Public Works um, on the call and they may be able to speak more to um, the traffic, um, the local transportation analysis that was done on the project, which um, really influenced um, the recommendations for the traffic lights. I did want to note though, um, so one of the constraints with lo 
where driveway curb cuts were located on the project site include the new realignment of Park Avenue. Um, so as part of the Park, Park Avenue realignment, the goal is to make that a very pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly um, street experience, extending the Paseo de San Antonio from San Jose State University eventually and hopefully all the way to Guadalupe River um, and that river trail there. So with that, um, one of the site constraints was that we didn't want any curb cuts um, to remain on or along Park Avenue. So we went from four frontages to just three. Um, and then Market Street is just a one way. So that poses some issues as well. Um, Jason or Manjeet, did you wanna to speak to um, maybe the, uh, the, the reasons we requested the stoplights? Good evening, uh, commissioners. This is Sam Young with Public Works. Uh, just to, uh, as, as Cassandra mentioned out, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Park Avenue is uh, more pedestrian focused. As, so as you can see, there is uh, no uh, curb cuts uh, along along Park at the Park Avenue. Uh, San Fernando is uh, uh, bike focused, and there is a, a raised bikeway that's being proposed along uh, uh, San Fernando. Um, the main entrances also uh, include uh, along Almaden Boulevard and also uh, uh, which, which, which will also be signalized. So there's only a certain amount of uh, cars that can enter into uh, the, uh, along Almaden Boulevard. So that's why the entrances along San Fernando ne would be necessary. Uh, we also try to minimize the uh, curb cut uh, width along market. Um, it is the one way, as, as Cassandra had mentioned, and that, that uh, curb cut width is limited to 14 feet. So basically, if given the volume of cars, uh, you know, we, the main uh, volume of cars that are entering into the site would be through San Fernando and also Almanin Boulevard. So it's a real balance given the size of development to to uh, uh, to uh, uh, incorporate uh, an adequate number of, of, of entrances, and um, so in in order to prevent any major backups along Almond uh, Boulevard, uh, San Fernando uh, would be necessary. Um, keep in mind that there's also a loading area off San Fernando, um, so so that all that all. Um, uh, so that all that is necessary in terms of uh, adequate loading, loading entrances as well. So we did limit the number of curb cuts along San Fernando to two. So I don't know if you have anything else to add, Manjeet or, or Jason. Uh, no, and I mean we we did try as much as possible to uh, work with the better bikeway plan. Um, and really try to make a better interface between the garage, um, especially that right turn um, coming out of the garage with the with the bike lane. But again, we are we are constrained with um, with the number of vehicles along Almaden already, um, and so we didn't need the additional access points along San Fernando. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so, if I understand correctly, the the number of entrances and exits on the project is directly related to the number of cars that you expect um, at the site, which kind of goes back to what a few people said, and that is that we are very close to Deerdonk Station. And, and I guess I would argue that, um, you know, perhaps we should be pushing folks to not drive as much to this area. Um, and therefore, we then wouldn't need those extra exits and entrances on San Fernando. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna push for that and hope that um, when a motion comes before the commission, they might um, include in the motion that the the city council consider um, to me what is a really a really important piece of this that we need people to be using transit to get around. We need people to be walking and biking, and if you build it, they will come. Until we constrain, and this is something we we control, right? If we build six thousand parking spots, they're probably gonna get filled up. And if we don't, people are gonna find a different way of getting there. Um, as it, there's, there's that piece of it. I'd love for my colleagues to entertain, um, uh, you know, recommending to the council that we um, uh, either reduce parking here and, um, and or at least remove the signals on San Fernando so that we're not working at cross purposes. I mean, my understanding is 
we actually have a grant, an ATP grant, I think it's an ATP grant um, to make San Fernando even better than it is. So it just, it doesn't make sense to me that we're using public money to beef up this bike um, boulevard and at the same time, making it less convenient for bicyclists through this development. So that's, that's, a, that's a concern of mine. Um, I had um, two other comments uh, or questions, and that is, um, I'm interested in, uh, it, it was really interesting to read the, about the alternatives in the EIR. There's a whole lot of alternatives. Um, and I'm wondering, based on my travels, um, seeing how some other countries do historic pres uh, preservation, and I am not arguing one way or the other here, I just wanna understand the issue a little better. Um, if in those alternatives, uh, they considered building over historic buildings as opposed to just saying that particular building was gonna be preserved and we weren't, we might use it for something, but we wouldn't necessarily build on top of it or over it in some way. So can you clarify if the alternatives did consider building over a building? And I don't even, you know, probably the historic preservation folks would not like that idea. I don't actually know, but um, I'd love to hear if that was considered because I've seen it done in other areas. This is Rima Mahamud again. No, we did not consider building over because of the way the project was laid out. It looked like the building could be preserved uh, without anything being built over it. So that's what we looked at. And I would ask the, um, uh, the applicant if they have anything more to add in terms of building over. Uh, um, can you hear me now? I've unmuted myself. Yes, we can. Um, yeah, so um, we evaluated um, a, num a number of options, um, and I can share some of those with you, uh, if you like, um, in addition to building over uh, the project. Let me just um, pull up that slide for you uh, and show you. Um, the, there are significant challenges, obviously, with building over. Um, and, you know, when I was presenting earlier, um, I shared uh, the idea that, um, I, you know, we had, a, we had evaluated a lot of um, possibilities collaboratively uh, with PACSJ, and this was one of those that we had looked at. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, there's no way to build over the building without putting columns down through it. And uh, at that point, you really haven't preserved the building anymore. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, like I said, I'll, I'll defer to the, the experts in, in preservation on whether that's acceptable or not. But I was curious to, to know if that type of op option had been explored. Um, I have a, I think a final question and that is for the applicant. Um, I am impressed with uh, a lot of the the bike um, elements of this and the, the pedestrian elements and the public realm and I'm wondering um, you know we do see I, I see in my professional life a lot of folks who are well-intentioned um, and um, want to do some great bike stuff and then the, the execution of it um, kind of misses like they'll be really excited. Oh, Shiloh, come see our new bike racks. We put in all these bike racks, they're awesome. And I'll go and I'll look and they're these fancy bike racks that actually don't function very well. You can't get a U-lock around them or so. There's like the little details are overlooked. So um, I don't mean to imply you might not know what you're doing, but, um, but, but the question will sound a little patronizing. And that is, I'm wondering, you know, who on your team, which consultants you've brought on to advise you on bike stuff so that when it comes down to the nitty gritty details, um, the execution is, is awesome. It's a, it's a great question. Um, and I would like to share uh, my screen if I can to just address that comment and uh, your previous comment about um, San Fernando as well, because it was related, um, even though you didn't ask us directly. Um, if that's okay, um, because I think they go a little bit hand in hand, and I recognize your second question is more the nitty gritty, as you say. Um, 
the existing bike lane along San Fernando, uh, as you know, is a as a kind of a temporary class three uh, bike lane. And what we are proposing with this project is a permanent class four uh, bike lane, which will be not only safer by virtue of being class four, but it will also be uh, not temporary in its appearance and nature, and it will be much more aesthetically pleasing. Um, and essentially what we end up with along San Fernando, as you can see in this image, is really uh, two curb cuts. And both of those are at the intersections where the streets from the north uh, meet the project. And as uh, explained by staff, those are signalized as this project is proposing them, signalized, fully signalized intersections. And this was really worked out in concert with DOT and Public Works so that there's a very safe movement of cars in and out of the building below grade. Um, all of the parking below grade uh, needs those access points. And then the service vehicles, which come in and out at those same signalized intersections, so that you have that kind of confluence of vehicles, ingress, egress through the project that is safely separated through the signalized intersections from cyclists. Uh, and cyclists, um, you know, I think uh, this is a very important point. Uh, and I think in one of the things that we're starting to see in our research at Gensler, which we do a lot of research, is you know, how we're going to respond as cities in a post-pandemic world. And one of those is to accommodate greater cycling to work um, and multimodal uh, ways of arriving at work and making that not a second class experience, but a first class experience. Uh, and so these uh, bike rooms are provided at grade. It's not taking an elevator into a basement somewhere. Um, and they allow you, we've really thought through the details and it may be hard to appreciate in this plan of a way that you can access the bike room directly from the bike lane, go in there. Um, and then you can go from those bike rooms back into the building lobbies or into the central promenade or into the Paseo uh, so that there's that kind of connectivity. So those are the details in terms of the planning that we've thought about. And then in terms of your question about the details of, um, so I, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, the number of curb cuts, I think it's much improved over the current condition in terms of safety um, through that kind of care and thought. Um, and as mentioned earlier, Park Avenue has no curbs anymore. Um, it's much more pedestrian oriented. And then on Almaden Boulevard, we have the one intersection, which is a mid block intersection, which corresponds with the ingress and egress out of the Adobe uh, headquarters directly to the west. So that's aligned at that intersection. So uh, that's the kind of thought and has gone into making really great contributor in terms of bicycle safety around downtown. And then to your question about getting the details right, I think that's absolutely critical in terms of the design of the bike racks and all that. Uh, we're in the early days of that uh, design process, but I can tell you that we have some, I think, really exciting ideas about uh, wayfinding and uh, create, you know, naming these bike rooms um, according to some of the mountains uh, around. So you, know, you might be able to say that your bike's at the Mount Hamilton bike room or at the Mount uh, Diablo bike room and, and so on. Uh, and so those are the kinds of details that we're starting to get into now as the project progresses. Um, hopefully that helps to answer that question. Yeah, it does, thanks. Um, and there, there are lots of different consulting firms around here that specialize in bike stuff and I'm sure they'd be happy to advise you if you haven't already brought someone on um, to the team. Um, with that, I'm, I'm seeing that Commissioner Allen's hand is raised and I just wanna um, reiterate that I would love to see a motion made where we recommend that the um, council reduce the parking in order to, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, one of which would be to then um, uh, not have an exit and an entrance on San Fernando. Um, I just wanna reiterate for my colleagues that um, San Fernando, if you don't know, San Fernando is a bike boulevard that we're investing a lot of resources into, and it just seems a shame that we would um, jeopardize that by um, slowing bikes down and um, creating two more signals that we potentially uh, stop it. So um, with that, I'll call on, well, uh, Commissioner, looks like Commissioner Allen's hand went down. and It was a vestigial hand, Chair. It has been removed. Yes. Okay. 
Commissioner Yesney. Commissioner Yesney. Oh, find the button. Um, I uh, would like to make a motion. Second. So if, the, if the commission is ready for it. Um, I would move the staff recommendation, certification of the EIR, uh, adoption of the findings as proposed, and approval of the project. Um, in recognition of your concerns, Madam Chair, I would add um, a request that the council uh, evaluate the need for the parking shown on the site. We have an EIR completed, extensive analysis done, and to arbitrarily change the amount of parking, the design or other aspects of the project at this point, which will undoubtedly affect the financing for the problem, project or something, if nothing else, I'm uncomfortable trying to tie the council down in that way. But I would be prepared to recommend that um, the council uh, ask the applicant to work with the city to, I, I understand the parking bomb issue. It's a hell of a lot of parking right in the middle of downtown. But this is going to revitalize a portion of downtown, I think. And I don't want to screw with it at this point. So confirm my second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Um, I see I see a hand up by a Sam, why? Yeah, this is Sam Young with Public Works. I, I just wanna add that an, uh, a local transportation analysis has been conducted for this site. And in terms of the operations of San Fernando, uh, two, those two signals were, were warranted, not only in terms of the, because to facilitate cars coming in and out of the building, even with a reduced reduction of of, uh, of, of uh, uh, vehicles entering the site, it is also for the safe operation of of uh, uh, loading area. So, so those regardless of of the vehicle parking, yeah, the, those those two signals at those locations are warranted in or in terms of uh, operational safety of those intersections when you're balancing vehicles, uh, bikes, and pedestrians. So Sam, your contention is there's no way to make San Fernando safe with loading vehicles and bicycles without signals there. That's, that's, uh, that's your contention? Correct. We, we, I mean, we work extensively with, with the developer in, the, in reducing uh, the number of curb cuts. And we will also work with our bike team in order to to uh, try to reduce the number of driveway cuts as much as possible. So we did go through an extensive study in, in the reduction of amount of, of curb cuts. Do we, I'm curious, do we have anyone from DOT or anyone who kind of speaks for the, for the bike team that can comment on that as well? We don't have anyone online, no, um, but we have been in coordination with DOT and their bike staff on those issues. So in par as part of the LTA, we do, we do extensive coordination and, and that part of the LTA is to eval evaluate not only pedestrian circulation, but also bike circulation and vehicular circulation. Um, okay, and, and thank you, Michelle, for um, acknowledging my concern and incorporating that into the motion. Um, uh, does anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Or Commissioner Yesney, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I would. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about uh, things like preserving the the existing redevelopment project and how important it is. I came to work for San Jose right after that project was built and have listened for years to apologies from redevelopment and planning staff for having built a building that was so inappropriate, so badly designed that related so poorly to its surroundings and consisting of somewhere between motley and mediocre architecture that I'm not sorry to see that something is replacing it. Um, 
it, uh, it probably is a great illustration of why redevelopment projects all over the state are being eliminated. Um, they were built in a hurry and uh, economic development was the main priority. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how many alternatives were evaluated in the EIR and even a reference to the alternatives didn't include all of the alternatives. If we evaluated all possible alternatives in an EIR, we'd never get an EIR certified. But my, my biggest issue on this project is that the courthouse building is cited as a, an example of brutalist architecture. And I think that word describes it really well. Um, I understand that we should um, keep in mind what has come before, that we only learn from history or we make mistakes, the same mistakes over again. But I don't think anything called brutalist architecture uh, should have a big place in our civic structure. Uh, just the name of it is, and I think the police department headquarters is supposed to be brutalist architecture as well. So we do have one remaining example. Anyway, um, I, I think this project is extremely interesting looking as well as interesting in concept. I hope it is executed as effectively as it looks in the plans. And I'm very excited about seeing this part of San Jose uh, take off. Um, which I think is what's going to happen. So uh, uh, that's why I recommended approval and while I be while I while I will be voting for approval. Thank you. All right. Um, Commissioner Oliverio, did you want to speak to your second? Sure. I just, just wanted to say I listen to both sides and I don't believe a deferral is necessary. I support the professional planning staff's work on the EIR. And so that's why I seconded the uh, motion. Uh, the city council faced another a uh, situation like this years past when I was on the council regarding the uh, same architecture type of the main library. And in that case, the council removed that structure in the case of a public project. That was the expansion of the convention center. Uh, I viewed this in, in a similar situation, but also this, each of these projects are uniquely different. And I think that's why the EIR is a solid, a solid document. Um, we have uh, always desired more jobs in our downtown for vibrancy, a tax base to pay for city services. The city of San Jose is, uh, uh, as you, uh, as everyone knows on this commission, is a uh, more housing than jobs. And we've always strived to get that balance in check and or to improve that. And this project would do that uh, coming to fruition. And it's nice to hear that the bike lanes would be in, uh, improved from class three to class four. I appreciated that uh, perspective of uh, your explanation to the chair's question. And uh, thank you very much. All right, um, Commissioner Bonilla. I just wanted to say that uh, this is, in my mind, uh, San Jose is the largest city in the Bay Area, 10th largest in the nation. This is a world-class project. And spending a lot of time in that section of the city, it's clear that something needs to happen from a, from a revitalization stimulation standpoint. And I see that being that. I, I think when I look at the the, the, the issue of whether or not that particular building is historic uh, in nature, uh, I think I have to always look at the totality of the circumstances. And, and, and although it, it is to some, uh, it, not, not to the point uh, that it should in any way impede uh, the ability for such an important project to move forward and in the process move the city forward. Um, that's not to say that in the future there won't be other projects where it'll go the other way. But with this particular project and this set of facts, in my mind, the, the value to the city as a whole uh, outweighs any other uh, concerns when it, comes, when it relates to that particular building. So for that reason, I will be voting uh, in favor of this motion. Uh, Commissioner Allen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Yesney stole one of my comments I was going to refer to um, or ask the question rhetorically possibly of why anyone would want to preserve an architecture style that's known as brutalist. Um, so I, I wholeheartedly agree with her comments. I couldn't have said them better. Um, I do think we're, uh, with regards to um, the concerns about uh, bike safety, pedestrian safety, um, and 
potentially conflicting interest in terms of um, making San Fernando more bike friendly and then the need, needs of this project. I think we run into, I, I appreciate the concern, absolutely, and I support the um, the nuance that Commissioner Yesney brought to her motion. I would point out that once again, I think we're at the that confluence point between policy and project, and this is a project and we are not policy makers. So there, uh, we have had policies before us, the downtown design standards, um, and occasionally we will get general plan review uh, information before us that we're able to comment on and offer feedback on. And that, I believe there was a whole discussion of cutouts during our discussion of the downtown uh, design guidelines that were recently brought forward, I want to say within the last year or so. Um, so I certainly paid attention to that. Um, and uh, I appreciate staff's work on this project and staff's attention to detail and the staff's uh, attention to all of these matters. Um, but I would certainly encourage, um, if we wanna see and encourage more bikeability, less parking, and all these other um, fantastic elements of a more sustainable society, which I, again, wholeheartedly agree with, um, we do need to work at a, at a much higher policy level so that we're not making decisions uh, on any one project and putting any conditions on any one project, but we're applying the conditions equally equitably throughout the entire city. Um, so I'm supportive of the motion. I really thank the developer and the applicant for bringing this forward. This is going to be, a, I hate to use the word game changer, but I will. This is going to be a, a game changer for downtown San Jose. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how it uh, is incorporated into our uh, urban fabric. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. Um, I agree with, with the comments of my colleagues and just uh, want to hammer again on the point that um, there's something that we've been learning from our shelter in place time and that is that um, having a transportation system that's resilient, sustainable, affordable, um, and where people can do everything um, within their community is really, really important. And we have an opportunity to do that here. Um, so again, I would just, I mean, we have to make some really tough decisions on whether we're going to continue to advantage cars or we're going to like make some really hard decisions and um, be advantaging other forms of transportation. We have the opportunity to do that here. So um, with the motion, I'm hoping that the council does um, consider uh, the, the leeway that it has to work with the developer and reduce the number of cars that are gonna be coming to downtown San Jose and instead have folks rely on the wonderful transit station that we're gonna have and the wonderful bike infrastructure that we're gonna have. And I'll, say, I'll just wrap up by saying, uh, the city council has been wonderful in leading on bike issues and um, has absolutely demonstrated their support for it with a, resourcing a wonderful um, bike and transportation team. and um, so all of that is really wonderful to see. And with that, um, we will go ahead and go for a roll call. Unless Commissioner Yesney, your hand is up. Did you wanna say something further? No, thank you. Okay. All righty. Um, then we will go ahead and uh, do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Yesney. Aye. Commissioner Caballero. Aye. And Shiloh, aye. Uh, with that, motion carries. So thank you all. Thank you to everybody who came. Well, you didn't come out to speak, but I'm accustomed to saying that. Thank you for participating by Zoom. Um, and with that, we will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Which is agenda item six, referrals from city council boards, commissions, or other agencies. And we have um, the 6A, which is uh, the planning commission amendment. Uh, and this is a recommendation that's going to the city council about changes to how planning commissioners are appointed. Um, does staff have a have anything that they wanted to say on this? Yes, good evening. Um, uh, Alice Powell uh, with Planning Building Code Enforcement. I'll be going through a brief presentation. Um, so I'll pull that up in just a second. Can you see my screen? Yes. 
Perfect. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners, members of the public. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Alex Powell uh, of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. I'll be delivering a brief presentation on the Planning uh, Commission Composition Ordinance Amendment um, and uh, a little bit of the history and next steps. So first, um, a little bit of background um, on the uh, April 18th, uh, 2019 memorandum from Mayor and uh, Council, um, or from actually, the Rules Committee. Um, there are six major components of this I'll go through uh, briefly. The first was to amend Chapter 2 of the Municipal Code to pro prohibit uh, planning two planning commissioners residing or coming from the same district, and then also to provide that commissioners may only be reappointed no more than once. Second, draft a charter amendment to uh, restructure the planning commission to include 11 members, uh, which will also include one from each district and one at large. Third, amend the lobbyist ordinance uh, to prevent a registered lobbyist uh, within the last two years from being appointed to the Planning Commission. And fourth, uh, extend the revolving door ordinance provision to apply to former Planning Commissioners. Fifth, uh, conduct convenings and partnerships in support of a recruitment plan for training and, um, and recruitment of future Planning Commissioners. And finally, sixth, uh, improve the application and interview process. Yeah. So, um, we have brought this item to the Planning Commission before on February 26, 2020, at a uh, Planning Commission study session. Following that study session, staff had planned to uh, conduct a series of uh, outreach, um, including the Neighborhood uh, Commission briefing on March 11th, three community meetings uh, in March and April, a couple in the evening, and one on Saturday. And then finally, also conduct uh, public polling, as a charter amendment would obviously require an, uh, a vote by the, by the public. And that polling was originally planned for March. All of these planned public outreach has been either canceled or put on hold due to the current COVID-19 crisis. Given the situation that we're in with the COVID-19 crisis, staff have proposed a multiple phase approach to uh, implementing or, or implementing council direction. The first phase on the left-hand side of this slide is the, is the recommendation that we bring before you today. That first phase includes um, a two commissioner limit from each council district and a two term limit um, uh, for any commissioner or applying for reappointment. We also ask that council consider a one commissioner limit from each council district as a further method to uh, improve the geographic diversity of the planning commission and also consider an ability of the council to override any of, the, uh, of these recommendations by a majority vote. This is the phase one that we're bringing to you today and that we will be taking to council on June 2nd. The second phase includes the other items from the original rules committee memo, which includes the 11 member charter amendment, the lobbyist ordinance, uh, the revolving door ordinance and ongoing outreach and recruitment, um, all of which require a, a greater level of community outreach that is difficult um, during this COVID-19 crisis. All these items would be carried forward at a, at a further date, um, most, uh, most recently in the next calendar year, and particularly with the Charter Amendment during the next election in uh, 2022. So the next steps, um, obviously we're here today on May 27th for the Planning Commission meeting. Um, we'll be taking this item to next Tuesday's City, uh, city Council meeting. Um, the second reading of the ordinance will take place on June 9th. And of course, as the um, end of, uh, of current commissioner's terms um, is at the end of June, um, there are several dates that are potential special council dates for planning commission interviews on the 15th, 19th, 22nd, or 26th. Um, so that concludes staff's presentation and we're available for questions or any feedback from the commission. Do my fellow commissioners have any questions or comments for staff? Question. Uh, Commissioner Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. So, staff, uh, staff, are you hoping for a uh, motion from this commission with a recommendation? Yes, we are recommending that the Planning Commission recommend the um, the uh, ordinance amendments uh, as laid out in the memo and the attached ordinances. Okay, and could you put that one back up that that slide, please? Uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, this one, phase one and phase two. Thank you very much. If I if I may just comment on it, uh, first of all, I think any notion of doing a charter amendment is foolish. 
accomplish, especially in a time of budget constraints. Uh, the cost to put that on the ballot will be about the cost of three uh, city planners' salaries. Uh, so I just think that's just a silly use of money uh, when there are pertinent items that the city may want to consider. Uh, when it comes to this discussion that the council had regarding geographic, geographic diversity um, with the commission, uh, clearly restricting uh, any number of people from a particular district does that. The two, uh, basically, uh, if you do the two, that is as many as four uh, council districts would be represented on the city council. If you did the one each, that would be seven. Uh, still not the 11, but better than the four. Um, there's, you know, other things out here, but for me, the main question is, you know, what should it be if, you know, ultimately the council has been appointing members of the planning commission for decades, because we've never changed this, uh, the, the charter and it's worked effectively in my opinion, but understand that uh, you can, this, the council can change uh, by ordinance and make some changes. And uh, I, I can't support the staff recommendation uh, because of phase two and on the phase one, I think it's, it's not, if, if the goal is diversity by council district, then clearly the one commissioner from each district is it. If, if it's diversity based on another factor, then policy, this recommendation doesn't do that. So those are my comments, but I, I can't support the staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Oliverio. Um, Commissioner Yesney, it looks like you have a, your hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair, yes. Um, actually, I can echo Commissioner Oliverio's comments. Um, I, I'm appalled that anyone thinks that a commissioner should represent the area where he lives. I do understand that geographic diversity means you may get people with broader knowledge of the city, which is a good thing, but right uh, what has always been the case is as planning commissioners we're responsible for every decision we make for anywhere in the city and if we don't know enough to make the decision then we need to educate ourselves but somehow implying that only someone who lives in a district is in a position to make a good recommendation or uh, take proper action is uh, i think misleading um I think if the, the two parts of phase one, one commissioner limit from each council district, um, that means every single member of the planning commission has to be from a different council district, apparently. Is that right? Yes? Correct. I don't, I, I, I don't like the idea. I think it's bad for San Jose. Um, so I'm not going to support the staff recommendation either. All right. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Commissioner Bonilla, and then I see both Vera and Rosalind have their uh, hands up. You know, I, given, you know, the route I took to, to get on this uh, steam body, I, you know, I definitely know firsthand the how interesting the process or at least my experience was uh, and i think for me you know i just voted on a major project that in my mind you know my whole thinking behind it was always about what is in the best interest of the city i'm not certain that either of these necessarily gets the job done i do believe firmly though that geographic diversity is important not for the purpose of representing a district i don't represent a specific district uh, I, but i do bring a lens i think all of you bring a lens and, and that lens enriches the conversation. I've learned more about bicycles uh, on my time on this commission because of Chairwoman Ballard. There's value in that. There's value in that perspective. And I think that's the real conversation that in my mind uh, needs to be brought to light here. Um, so because of that, you know, again, I'm not certain this is necessarily the way. I, I do think there's a, a bigger conversation that needs to happen. But I'll also talk about the fact that outreach is lacking. I think from my time within the city, uh, you know, the city as a whole uh, talks a good game about communication. We're seeing, you know, COVID-19 ravaging not only the world, but in Santa Clara County East Side uh, is being impacted. You don't see the effort in terms of major expenditures and community outreach. And the same goes for the Planning Commission. I did not know there was an appointment to the Planning Commission until about the third time when you had gone through your cycles already and the, the council didn't want the candidates at that time and someone forwarded it to me. 
So, and I'm in this uh, arena. So I think we do have to have geographic diversity. I think it's critical. Um, if, if, if things were done the right way, we wouldn't even need to have this conversation. I will support this, uh, not necessarily because I believe this plan is the best one, uh, but I do think it's important to, to continue the conversation and, and send to the council a very clear statement that uh, there is value in geographic diversity. Uh, I think to, to uh, I, I see your points about us not representing a district, but equally there is tremendous value. I can't tell you the amount of letters I get, emails that I get uh, from people in the community who I didn't even know were aware of what we did, who are, who are excited about the fact that someone that is near them uh, from a geographic standpoint sits on this body. So there is value in that and, and that can't be ignored. So with that, I will support it uh, just because I, I also get the sense that the majority of you are not gonna support it. And I do think it's important uh, to send a message to the council that the conversation needs to continue. And I don't want in any way, if this does not pass, for the message to be misconstrued as we think everything is okay. For the record, it is not okay. It should not have been that difficult uh, for this type of representation to be on this body. And the fact of the matter is it was, and I think that needs to be said. So with that, I conclude my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Bonilla. Um, I, I too agree that um, I, I don't necessarily like this recommendation. Um, and I, I do believe that we can send a message to the council that encourages them to continue the conversation that this isn't the right solution, but it is an important question that we need to resolve. So I, I find myself in line with Commissioner Yesney and uh, Commissioner Oliverio. Um, and with that, I, uh, I see that Vera has her hand up. So Vera. I just, I just wanted to add my two cents because I've been sitting with the commission for a number of years. And um, my main concern with the commission is the ability to have full membership in order to make decisions. And I, I was particularly concerned in looking at this recommendation um, in number C, which was limiting the numbers of the planning commission who reside in the same council district to one. With that said, we have had trouble in the past finding commissioners from each district or even having applicants that way, even though um, there have been broad um, requests for applications and by, the, by the city clerk and by the council members. Additionally, we have had a number of instances, there are a few that really come to mind, where we have had commissioners who have had to abstain because of conflicts. And then on top of it, we have had commissioners who may be absent where we couldn't even get a quorum of four people um, or, or we could not get at four people who, would, who could vote on a particular matter. So the more we restrict the number of members or, or have certain criteria for membership on the commission that may be difficult to fill, you may not be able to make decisions. And that's a primary concern of mine. Um, also, um, that is why um, suggestion number D is here that would allow the council to override the district limitation by majority vote. This um, is not, this was not put here as any kind of a political measure or anything like that. It was put there so that we could have a fully constituted commission. And these are considerations for the future, but I wanted to explain to you that the main concern is having a commission that is able to vote on projects. and. Um, that, you know, those are my comments on C and D as a result of that. Um, and so I know that you're being asked to um, opine on A and B primarily, but I did want to give you that view because I can think of projects that we have had to continue. And in fact, two or three years ago, we changed the commission bylaws to require only three out of four members to be able to pass um, on a matter to be able to vote on a matter other than general plan amendments which require a vote of four under state law. And the reason we did that was we had problems getting four commissioners um, who could vote. And, and you know, we didn't want to necessarily have to have everything um, have a unanimous vote in order to move through the commission with a recommendation or with a final decision. But anyway, I, I thought you, um, I needed to lend that perspective. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Director Huey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had one point of clarification. I just wanted to make it clear for the commissioners that um, current the current staff recommendation is is for phase one, 
And so you have that um, outlined in our memorandum. So the current recommendation is around phase one, uh, following the direction uh, that received from council um, earlier of last year. Phase two is something obviously the council could direct us to move forward with, but I just wanted to clarify what the current staff recommendation is. Um, and I did also want to note that City Clerk Tony Tabor is also on the call, should there be any questions for her as well. Thank you. I see Commissioner Caballero's hand is up. Yes, thank you, Chair Ballard. Um, so I will actually echo Rolando's comments. Um, I am, I honestly don't think this goes far enough. Um, I don't actually think it addresses the question that the city council really is trying to address, but I think it's a step in at least a direction that would change the way that we've always done business. Um, so I'm, this is not what I would really like to see. I do think that there were some great suggestions at the um, study session where we discussed this, uh, including considering folks who are possibly renters or who have other sort of um, mobile homes, other things like that, that would be uh, somebody from commercial, et cetera, that would really lend a diversity of knowledge to the commission. Um, but, and I also think that like one of the main issues is that outreach is difficult. Um, it's hard to get folks to commit to doing, uh, you know, probably 10 or more hours of work outside of their normal job. Um, but it's absolutely needed to have that diversity represent our city as a whole. And this commission has not represented our city um, for many, many years and, and still really doesn't um, for a variety of reasons. And so I, while I don't think that this, this recommendation is necessarily the right recommendation, I am going to support it um, because I do think that it at least takes us part of the way there. All right. Um, I see Commissioner Yezny's hand up. Oh, I was just going to suggest that part of what the council could do when they're recruiting is look at the totality of the individual. Um, I live in District 3 for years. When I was raising my daughter, I lived in District 7. My parents lived in District 1. Um, everyone here has talked about different aspects of their life. And so what they what you bring to the commission is everything that's ever happened to you. And um, that has been different for each one of us in a lot of different ways. Um, we have a very diverse council. And I think that given choices, they could make some good diverse changes in the planning commission that reaches what their goals are. And anything as simple as one from each district is probably not going to get them where they want to go. Espe listening to Commissioner Caballero is especially illustrative. There's there's so many aspects to people, and just look at our differences, and we're nothing like a cross section. So that's all I had to say. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bonilla. No, I'll go back to the point about outreach. I think at the core, a lot of this is an outreach issue. I think. Uh, you know, we're good at the city talking about, you know, dollars and cents and saving dollars, but at the core, this is an outreach issue. This is, if the city wants to see more diversity of, of, of geography, of, of just diversity, then you got to put some money behind it. You have to really make an actual effort to want to connect with people. When I first got to San Jose, the city hall, one of the first things I heard over and over and over again from everyone. We can't do this. We can't do that. This isn't how we do things in San Jose. Lucky for myself and the district I worked in, I ignored everyone. And the result of that was change. We made change. And I don't know if then council member Oliveira remembers, uh, you know, some of the things that, that happened during that time. But it happened because we never accepted the premise. So in my mind, if we're going to put something on the record, one of the things I strongly recommend is that we actually invest in in, in, in that outreach plan. Uh, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just shoot straight here, right? Uh, the elephant in the room. Before 
you know, my Commissioner Caballero myself got appointed, there was big talk about we, we just can't find people. We just can't find people. And then when the political heat was, we can't find, you know, we, we don't have anyone from the east side. We don't have anyone from these communities. Magically, magically, four candidates appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, I would have been okay losing to any of them because they were very qualified. So that tells me that this was never an issue of we couldn't find. This was an issue of we didn't want to find. And I think that's at the core. If the city really wants to make all of our commissions diverse, then make the investment. Make the investment to, to have those conversations, not just about commissions, but it, it's also very illustrative of the fact that there is a lot of outreach that isn't happening and people really are disconnected to their local government. So I, I want to kind of add that point. And, and since it's on the record, I think that's something that you know, I, I'd like to add as, as a friendly amendment, if that's possible, that we talk about an investment in outreach because my experience demonstrates you know, uh, that there are qualified candidates out there if there is a, the desire to find them. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better. I think Commissioner Bonilla, you just, you know, you, you, that was just very well said. There are plenty of excellent folks out there who could serve, um, but we're not, they, may, they just might not know for whatever reason. And, that may be deliberate on our part because that's how the system is set up. And I would argue it is somewhat deliberate because that is how the system is set up. Um, and we absolutely need to invest in uh, outreach. Um, with that, uh, I think we we would entertain a motion. Um, I, I just, again, wanna echo, um, I mean, I basically, agree with everything that's been said. I don't, as, as Commissioner Caballero said, it's not that I hate this proposal. I just don't think it goes far enough. And I don't think as Commissioner Oliverio was saying, it's solving the problem that we set out to solve. It's, it's doing it in a way that's easy. It's like the easy, you know, geography is a proxy for diversity. Yeah, at some level. Um, but it just doesn't, in my mind, it doesn't go far enough in terms of really it is the responsibility of the city council to look at the makeup of the planning commission and say, you know what, we've got too many people who represent this particular perspective. And so we need someone who represents more of a renter perspective, or we need someone who can um, represent a developer perspective or an architect perspective or a young person perspective. Um, in, in the absence of that kind of thoughtfulness, um, doing things based on district and geography is the easy way to do it. Um, and it is a way, it's not horrible, but I just, I think it's more lazy than, and, and I would hope that the council would be more thoughtful about that. Um, so anyone want to make a motion? I see. Uh, question. Yep. Commissioner. Hello, Tony Tabor. Hi, Tony. Hello. Hey, how are you? Um, are you? So uh, since you probably, we have more experience at other, other government entities and what they do. I mean, the appointment process is throughout all levels of government, federal, state, county, city. Uh, um, but when you look, you're familiar with what, what type of um, things have uh, government entities done to, you know, to either you know, uh, really control the process of appointment or make sure that appointments are diverse. Um, can you speak to any of those? Well, I can speak. I've worked at five different government entities, um, all of whom have boards and commissions. Um, three of them, when I came in, the boards and commissions was a mess. It was not a mess in San Jose. Um, we had project diversity, but state law, we can't look at diversity anymore. So project diversity was phased out. Um, I know we, we've done more outreach in city of San Jose versus other cities i worked at. Um, as far as outreach goes at city of San Jose, we've run, I've run paid last year. I ran ads on Facebook. I post on Twitter. I post on Facebook. I create little postcards that the council members can just insert into their newsletters. So, so outreach in San Jose has been, is more intense but it's a bigger city, so it, you still aren't reaching a huge number of people with those things. Um, as far as, I worked at one city where 
the council got rid of all the commissions because it was just easier, they said, to get rid of all the ones they're not legally required to have. Um, mm -hmm. The appointment process in San Jose, each district is its own city. You know, it's 100,000 people. So um, there, it is difficult for a department like mine to, to reach out. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, if you're talking about like- It's you know, helping. <laughs> if you're talking about increasing diversity, um, that's something that was my goal from the beginning when I first got this job. Um, we did a, a study we, using Nextdoor. We, we had a company come in um, and did some tests with targeted advertisements for boards and commissions using Nextdoor. It did not increase our diversity of applicants. Um, so I, we definitely need something innovative to get out there. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying, you know, every year I'm trying something new. Like, how can I, like, I've, I send the ads to like every organization for which I have an email, but we still end up getting the same number of applications every year. Um, about 120 applicants over all of the boards and commissions. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Oh, thank you. I mean, at the beginning, you mentioned how you can't make decisions uh, on yeah, any. Can't. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing. So, yeah. So, a city or a government entity in the state of California cannot make decisions. Uh, what are what are the legal restrictions? You can't. On, you, you can't do gender or race um, or sexual orientation, any of those protected categories. So we we ask that information on our applications. The only people who see that is my office. Before even before we send it to the city attorney's office for a conflict review, that stuff's redacted out. Um, but it allows me to at least track to see it, are my applications tracking with the population. And we're pretty close. We're not exact, but we're we're pretty good at tracking with the, the like the thirty percent Asian applicants with the thirty percent Asian population. So I can track those things and then we can kind of compare applicants to appointed, but I'm the only one that ever sees that stuff because um, it's not used at all in the appointment process. It's more to tell me where am I lacking. And then what I do is I, I was with that company, I was, we were targeting sort of geographic areas where maybe we can get more applicants from this area because we're not getting applicants from this area. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, well, being that, that you know, restrictions on diversity and, and what some folks might like to see, but we know that each council district has a different composition of demographics, whether it be by income or race, and by having more uh, spread out, you know, uh, uh, more count more council districts on a given commission. Let's say the planning commission. That in itself doesn't guarantee, but it certainly uh, provides more opportunity for more diversity because, you know, as we mentioned, some council districts have different compositions of people, the majority of the people of a certain, uh, certain ethnicity, and that might have a higher propensity to net out a planning commission candidate. So if we're really looking at doing what's legally possible, and to Commissioner Bonilla's comments about making different perspectives known from different geographic areas, then really it's the one commission, based on the phase one uh, options here, it's the one commissioner per council district uh, without having to go spend money on election would give us the most geographic diversity and potentially potentially the most, uh, most diversity, not guaranteed, but the most. And then I think as far as recruitment, we already have uh, many people that serve that are civically minded on all sorts of other commissions. Perhaps the council goes from that pool and encourages someone that served on an already a city commission who's civically minded. And guess what? They might come from districts that aren't on the planning commission today. That that pool of candidates is then, you know, you know, you, for lack of better words, you served on another city commission, and now the planning commission, the only one in the charter, that's the, the you know, the, the the step up because you've already had experience dealing with all the, uh, uh, you know, the Brown Act and how city staff works and how you make recommendations, understanding you're not a policymaker, et cetera. And maybe that's the best pool 
that we can then recruit to the planning commission. So I would, I'll make a motion that we uh, move a recommendation to have one commissioner from each council district with a direction to recruit from existing commissioners. Don't put, don't cap them that they can't serve another term. Nope, you've already served on arts, parks, whatever. Now you have an opportunity to serve on the planning commission and that should be where we could have a greater propensity to pull uh, civically minded uh, people already uh, involved into potential planning commission candidates. All right, there's a motion um, that deviates from the staff recommendation. Um, it is to have one, one person from each district and to choose those folks from existing commissioners. Uh, is there a second on that motion? I can second that. Uh, second by Commissioner Bonilla. Um, I see Director Huey's hand up. Is that a holdover or? I'm sorry, that's a holdover, my apologies. Okay, no worries. Um, and Vera, same thing, I see your hand up. Uh, mine is not a holdover. I wanted to clarify the motion here. When we say one from each district, does that mean an 11 member composition of the commission no. or seven member? One, one for the current configuration of seven. Okay, but just different districts for each one. Okay. Correct. Thank you. And I'm, um, I'm not strongly uh, on override by majority vote. So if someone has a strong opinion, I don't. All right, Commissioner Caballero. I have a clarifying question to the motion maker. Um, the requirement to come from a previous um, commission, would that, so that would be a requirement now and no one who had, if you haven't been a part of a previous commission? No, I apologize. Okay. It would be, no, right. I apologize. It would be a, because we've talked about outreach and reaching this in, invisible person out here that we don't know that we keep spending money on ads and hoping the council member will send information out versus you've already got a pool of civically minded people it couldn't it should not be limited to but perhaps the council or tony the uh, tony Tabor reaches out to that group and says hey we got spots on the planning commission we really hope you consider it mm -hmm. which would be qualified and geographically diverse and probably diverse in other ways great thank you Hmm. Commissioner Yesney? I don't. Oh. Commissioner Yesney, you're muted. You want to? Yeah. No, I'm unmuted, I think. Uh, I, I have another suggestion, not that I'm real enthusiastic about it, but a lot of people think the Planning Commission is really boring. My daughter thinks it's really boring. Um, and a lot of people have no idea what we do. Getting someone to promise to go to meetings twice a month, some of them running late into the evening, although not very often anymore, to do something you don't understand for reasons that you're not really interested in, is that's a hard sell. And I, the people who could best explain what it's all about are us. So in terms of educating people about why they should want to be on the planning commission, maybe it's time some of the planning commissioners took a hand in it. If we think this is important, maybe we should make a little more effort to tell people what's involved. All right. We could also uh, actually we could make the pitch if to nobody else to people on other commissions. Okay, that's it. Um, Commissioner Bonilla, did you have uh, something further to say? Sure, no, I, yeah, I, I do. I actually like your point, Commissioner Yesney, and I think uh, actually brings it back to the outreach conversation. I think, you know, this last, this next go around, got calls from lots of people who were asking me, should they consider throwing their hat in the ring? These are people who were never in any way engaged in the way that we are in terms of you know, doing this boring stuff, right? And you know, the advice I gave everyone that called, because my policy, if you call, I'll talk to you, is do it. 
And, and, and I think what resonated with me in a couple of those calls was people who just community minded, who, you know, wanted to learn more. And I think for me, that's the value proposition that now there are people having conversations uh, about something that perhaps they didn't understand before, but they understand that it's important. Uh, but, but on that point, uh, I'll have a question for Tony Tabor. Tony, are you there? Tony. Yes, sorry, I couldn't get to my mute. No, that, that, that's okay. I, I have the ability to lull people to sleep, so I get it. <laughs> what is your overall outreach budget, uh, if, if you know that off the top of your head? I, I have no outreach budget. It just comes out of my regular, my regular budget. What is that number? My regular budget, um, including personnel and non-personnel, is about $7 million. No, no. What is the number of outreach within your regular budget? I, I don't, we don't break, my budget is not broken down like that. I have a lump sum for personal and a lump sum for non-personal. Um, and then of course, elections is separate. I don't have like a line item for outreach or boards, board of fair campaign, political practice mailings. Um, everything's just lumped together. All right, so let's let's talk about your Facebook example. Mm -hmm. I'm a public relations company. We have a whole unit that that's all they do. On average, if I wanna reach 15,000 people, uh, on a non-peak day, it's a hundred dollars tops. That that I, doesn't that doesn't think, sound like commitment to me. I I think I spent about two hundred dollars on Facebook ads last year. Was my first time doing it. That's what I thought. Yeah. And I did it for uh, targeted for planning commission, and mm -hmm. so did ads non-targeted for general boards and commissions to see am I increase my um, I'm kind of, Am I going to increase the number of applicants that I get? The capital of the Silicon Valley, largest city in the Bay Area, $200 for outreach to arguably its most important commission. And that's kind of my point. The point is, this is not just for recruitment. This is exactly what is wrong in many ways with a lot of the issues that our residents are facing on a daily basis. We think we're talking to them because we're doing the ads and we're micro-targeting, but it's 200 bucks. That's just going through the motions. That's not really, I'm not, this isn't specific to you, Tony. I'm not anyway indicting you here, uh, but that's exactly my point, lack of will. And I think that there needs to be some sort of allocation at the, at the council level where we don't make policy, we don't control budgets to make this a priority. Largest city in the Bay Area, highly diverse. If it's happening for recruitment on this issue, clearly I live in Eastside. It's clearly happening when it comes to COVID in terms of outreach or lack of, that's my point. So to me, this is not about the configuration of the commission. This is about something deeper uh, within our city, whether on purpose or not. I know from my experience there, there's absolutely a lack of will and it needs to be said. So with that, I conclude my comments. I know it's a late night and we all want to do some fun stuff like go to sleep eventually, but thanks for indulging me. Uh, Commissioner Allen. Well, I'm still waiting on dinner, Commissioner Benny. I don't know what kind of schedule you operate on. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll go to your house. I'll be outside. <laughs> I am absolutely not going to belabor our time here tonight, and I hope you're all thankful for that. I have uh, written all of my comments up and delivered those to staff. They have been included in an email to all of you today. So I'm simply going to note that I will be opposing any form of uh, staff's recommendation tonight. Um, any item, A, B, C, or D. Um, I think that, as many people have stated before, it's... It's a solution that does not solve the problem it's intended to. Um, so that's all I have to say. I'll be voting no. Thank you. All right. I have some hands up here. I'm not sure if folks still want to speak, but I've got Commissioner Bonilla. Your hand is up. Oh, no. I'm, 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 I'm clocked out. <laughs> okay. And Vera, your hand is up. Did you want to say something? Actually, um, I didn't think it was, but since it is, um, are we taking public, any, are there any public comments on this? Ah, good question. Uh, let's see, I'm going to the attendees here. Nobody has their hand up, um, so I'm gonna say no. Um, there's a motion on the floor uh, to do, as Commissioner Oliverio motioned, um, 
Commissioner Oliverio, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, I, I, no, uh, I mean, other than I think, uh, I think as, as long as everyone uh, is, understands the motion, then I think we're okay. If there's, if there's any misunderstanding of the motion, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, um, I think Commissioner Yesney seconded the motion. Would you like to speak to your second, Commissioner Yesney? Commissioner Bonilla did. Oh, it was yeah. Commissioner yeah. Bonilla. Okay. I, I Commissioner Bonilla who seconded. I can't even remember what the motion was. <laughs> um, I've got the, this is Vera. I have the motion written down. Um, it was um, a motion by Commissioner Oliverio seconded by Bonilla, which is that there would be one member of the commission from each district, but continuing the seven member um, commission that we have now, not expanding um, to 11, and that, that we would attempt to recruit from other commissions um, as part of the outreach, but we would not be limited to you know recruiting from other commissions. We would just make that part of the outreach. Do Thanks. I have that correctly, Commissioner Oliverio? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Um... I'm not seeing any other hands. I'm just gonna, again, state my feeling. I feel like this stuff is tinkering and it's not getting at the root of the problem. Um, and I think the root of the problem has been stated by all of us and is known. Um, and it's not that I think what's on the floor is horrible. It's just, I don't think it solves the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, my, to one last thing, back to Commissioner Yesney's point, I grew up on the west side Then I for 25 years, then I lived in South San Jose for 10 years. I worked in North San Jose for 15 years, and now I live close to downtown in District 6. So, um, you know, am I, am I a District 6 resident? I absolutely am, but I've lived in a lot of places in the city, and so I like to think I represent, I bring a, a broader perspective than just D6 to the um, commission. Um, and that's not to say I should stay on the commission. It's just, again, going back to the fact that geography can be used as a proxy for diversity, but um, it's just kind of an easy way of getting at that. And I don't think it's the best way. Um, it's, it's, with that- It's a legal way. Is it, yeah, there's, there, are, there are constraints, yes. Um, with that, let's go ahead and vote by roll call. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla. Aye. And this is to the motion made by Commissioner Oliveira, correct? Correct. Aye. Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Yesney. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Caballero. Aye. Commissioner Allen. No. And I will vote no as well. Uh, motion passes. And so moving on to uh, item seven, good and welfare. Uh, starting with a report from the city council. Is there anything from staff? Yes, there was only one item that went to city council this past week. Uh, it has to do with amendments to title 20, the zoning code. It passed. This has specific reference to uh, the density bonus and clarifications of uh, definition of permanent supportive housing. It passed. All right, thank you. Uh, is there a motion on the action minutes from May 13th? So moved. Is there a second? Commissioner second. Caballero seconds. Uh, any discussion questions on the motion? Seeing none, uh, we will vote by roll call. Commissioner Caballero. Aye. Commissioner Oliverio. Aye. Commissioner Yesney. Aye. Commissioner Bonilla. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Uh, that motion passes. 7C, subcommittee formation reports and outstanding business. Is there anything here? I'm going to assume no. Uh, 7D, commission calendar and study session. Nothing to report here? No items to report. Great. Um, anything for the public record? Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Allen. I just want to refer everyone to my Zoom backdrop and make sure that everyone has filled out their 2020 census. Uh -huh. I was wondering what that was. 
courtesy of the county census office. <laughs> oh, no, I thought I, it was the other one, the, the circles. <laughs> That's a reference to the band Fish. We can talk about that at another meeting. <laughs> all right. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.